Welcome to my Cali Looking Forward, a one-day conference in conjunction with the retrospective My Cali, currently uh, on view in the entire building of MoMA PS1. I hope all of you had the chance to see the show that was originally conceived and curated by Anne Goldstein for the State Alike in Amsterdam. And the New York version here uh, was curated by Connie Butler and our uh, Peter Ely. My name is Jenny Schlenska, I'm an associate curator here, and together with Joe Scanlon, I organized today's conference. And um, Joe um, brought in his team from the Princeton University, and we're very grateful to the Lewis Center for the Arts for the generous support to make this afternoon possible. Um, we talking about what we could do, we thought that we wanted to present new ideas about Mike Kelly's work and going forward what, after this retrospective. And uh, we have four programs. Uh, the afternoon will start with a keynote lecture by the Whitney's Elizabeth Sussman. Then we'll have a lecture by Princeton University's Stacy Wolf, professor of theater there. And then we'll take a short break. Uh, you can go and get a coffee or quickly walk through the show. And then we resume with the panel with Rachel Harrison, William pope L, and Joe Scanlon, moderated by myself. And the afternoon resumes by a valedictory address by John Welshman, who's an art history professor at the UC San Diego and also the chair of the Mike Kelly Foundation for the Arts who I would really like to thank um, at this point, especially Mary Claire Stevens, who I think is here this afternoon, who's made the show um, as extraordinary as it is, and um, she supported us with all her knowledge, a lot of time and enthusiasm. So thank you to Mary Claire. And now I have the honor to introduce Elizabeth Sussman, the Sondra Gilman Curator of Photography at the Whitney Museum of American Art, where she has organized many award-winning exhibitions. Among them, solo exhibitions by Paul Tech, William Eggleston, Maud Gordon Mother Clark, and Nan Golden. She was the curator of the most recent Whitney Biennial together with Jay Sanders, and she also co-organized the 1993 Biennial. We invited Elizabeth primarily because she organized Mike Kelly's first large-scale mid-career retrospective at the Whitney in 1993 called Mike Kelly Catholic Taste and which that show became a pivotal moment in Mike Kelly's career. So please welcome Elizabeth Sutman. Thank you. see me? <laughs> Barely. I'll stand on my tiptoes. Um, first slide, please. <laughs> I had the honor of um, being uh, the first person to ask Mike Kelly to do a mid-career survey in 1993, and so um, I am going to bookend my talk with uh, that experience and then my most recent experience uh, of inviting him to be in the, um, in the 2012 biennial uh, in which we included the last work he made in his life. So uh, I want to start though by saying that um, I really believe that, that the future looks great. I think that uh, the legacies of Kelly are extremely important and they are active um, very much in the art world that I look at. And I just thought I'd start by showing you three artists' work that came my way and just casually thinking about uh, who was going to carry this forward. So uh, this is Mike in, in the 93 Biennial, but we'll look at that again. But next slide, please. This is uh, a picture from Rachel Harrison's uh, most recent catalog, 
which uh, she sent me, and as I leafed through it, and as I was thinking about today, I, this picture came up. And I know that this has to be some kind of an homage to Mike. This is uh, the, the, the uh, poet as janitor, which is what John Miller called him in 1993. And it's definitely a reference to, um, to Kelly and all the issues of class and work, et cetera, that percolate through his work. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture from the 2012 uh, Biennial, and the work is uh, a work of a young artist whose name is Sam Lewitt. He, is, um, has, he has written recently um, for Texterkunst on Mike Kelly, so I know Mike Kelly's on his mind, but you can see from looking at this work that it uses garbage bags, it uses the floor, and it uses uh, substances, as in this case, ferrofluid, which is something that's everywhere in the technology we have today. And definitely, uh, Sam is in many, many ways looking at Kelly's work, and I think this proves it. And then uh, another slide, please. This is the work of um, Nick Guanini, who some of you may know, who's written a marvelous text also that came out recently in Texterkunst about criticism and artists, and artists who work as critics and critics who work as artists, and he's one of them, Nick. And Nick himself made this artwork, which are called his testicular prints, where he, he bathed his testicles in paint and then just touched all kinds of uh, uh, ephemera that relate to art and the art world with that imprint. So um, I think all the people that I've just mentioned, plus many more in other countries, because these are all American artists, are talking about the kinds of things, the um, trash, culture, excrement, erotic play, um, the connections to critique, to theory, to class, and to work. All these themes are so deep into the into the work of Mike Kelly, and they are going to be played out, it, it seems clearly to me, by a generation of great artists, and some of them are going to talk later this afternoon. But now I want to go back and to um, try to, to uh, play out a little bit in real time, if you'll indulge me, uh, a period between 1988 and 1993 when Mike Kelly and I were in active conversation with each other and which culminated in Catholic taste. So next slide, please. Uh, this is the first work that I ever uh, experienced of Mike Kelly. This was not in Catholic taste as it's, as it's um, set up here. But this was, I think, the trigger point for me. This is um, an installation where in order to see what's inside that room, which is full of banners and paintings that have to do with a, um, they were, it was called Plato's Cave, Lincoln's Profile, and um, uh, Rothko's Chapel. Anyway, but in order to see that, you had to lie down on the floor and you had to crawl. You had to crawl like a worm, as Mike said in his drawing, to get in there. And I remember um, very well the sensation of doing that and how just everything changed for me physically. And uh, when, I, when I saw this picture again recently, and began to work it into my talk today, I saw that this crawling, this underneath, this um, sense of what it means to sort of get really physical with a work of art actually, or to be very squirmy and un uncomfortable in the presence of it, that this, this was the critical Mike Kelly experience. And once you had had this experience, it, was, it either really turned you off in, in, um, in the late 80s, and a lot of people were very turned off by Mike Kelly, or it was very exciting. And to me, it was exciting. So just a picture or two of Mike. This is um, him as a young man. He used this in um, some uh, work he did with Sonic Youth. Next picture picture of Mike and Banana Man. I didn't know Mike for any of this very early uh, performance work. I came into it really in mid-80s, and uh, I didn't live in California. I lived in Boston, so I actually missed out on a lot of this. And when I went to work with him on the retrospective, it was a real problem. Next. This is um, the exhibition, part of the exhibition, Half a Man, which was um, a very much of a breakthrough exhibition uh, for Mike. It, um, it was uh, 
in New York in about 1987 or 1988, and in California slightly before that. It was the moment when he stopped making performances so much and invested much more of his time and energy in making objects and installations. Next slide. This is, um, you can see that um, Mike is at the very beginning of his stuffed animal work, which was part of Half a Man, and he's um, very much, I think this is a great picture, I was glad when I found it, because it begins to show Mike um, exploring in himself and in his work this idea of what it was to be half a man. And I think that um, this was just one of the many things that he began to take on. Um, and it's a, it's a very critical point for him to take this on because for me it shows that Mike is beginning to investigate himself. And I think if I want to make any um, real comment about Mike now that he is he's uh, dad, I think that if you look back over the trajectory of his work, he was really always working through his own material, his own self. Next. This work was shown at the Whitney before I got there, and this is one of the great pieces from um, this Half a Man series when he used, as you all know this very well, and it's upstairs in the exhibition, but it was the first piece that the Whitney actually bought. Next slide. And this piece was done before the 19, um, before um, Catholic tastes also. But I think it's, um, it's interesting because here he's taking up, beginning to take up all of his favorite subjects, half a man, and now you see this is, this is all about criminality. This is pay for your pleasure. And it was shown first in Chicago, and then every place it was shown after that, it had to have a drawing in it by somebody who was actually in prison and taking art classes. And so um, this was, uh, had quite a backstory when it came to New York, um, because the prisoner uh, became very emotionally involved with Mike as a result of having his, his work of art included in the Whitney Museum and Mike's work of art. Next slide. This again is the, um, the, uh, the crawl piece that we looked at before. Next slide. Now, I'm just gonna back up for a minute because um, the years I'm talking about were the years after I first met Mike, which is actually met him, which was in 1988 when I was working on an exhibition called The Binational, which was about sending a group of American late 80s artists to Germany. Mike was included in that exhibition and he went to Germany. Actually, this was his first trip to Germany, and he uh, met many people who were to become important to him on this trip. Um, but I was at the same time working on an exhibition. Actually, one of my uh, co-curators, Mark Francis, is out in the audience. The exhibition was about the Situationist International, and a group of us had come together to work on it. It was actually Mark's idea, and the show opened in Paris and then went to London and then came to Boston where I was working. And I was working simultaneously on, on this exhibition about the Situationists and with Mike. And um, so Mike became very, very interested in what I was, in what this was all about. And in particular, he was interested in one of the other curators who was working on this show, who was Griel Marcus, who at the time was, had just written a book, which came out in 1989, called Lipstick Traces. And in Lipstick Traces, uh, Traces uh, Marcus makes the connection between the Sex Pistols and Malcolm McLaren and the Situationists, who were a group of anti-art, loosely uh, artists, writers, uh, theoretical people who had banded together in Europe uh, in the mid-50s and who had been uh, very active and had um, been extremely active in the 68 um, student uh, revolt in Paris. So there was a, a in Lipstick Traces, and indeed, in the exhibition that we developed, there were these connections between radical politics, between art and uh, theory. And Mike was um, enormously interested and very, very annoyed at, at me and this whole phenomenon. And um, 
so this was, um, I, I wanted to bring this into the discussion to show how working with, with Mike and putting together this very important show for him was a matter of him taking into account all kinds of things that were happening uh, with me, with the art world at that time. So um, this, pr this particular connection, though, of music and theory and Europe annoyed him enormously. And he uh, backed, backed into me. He, he ultimately ended up writing about this and about, about lipstick traces and really being annoyed that it was so Eurocentric. This, um, this, it, 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 this coincided with his working through his own retrospective, his thinking about Detroit, which was always very important to him, and his thinking about Detroit and Detroit's relationship to the late 60s, to, uh, to radical music, radical politics, uh, politics in general, and it it really brought into Mike's um, the forefront of Mike's mind the importance of the American counterpart to the European um, situation of the late 60s, which became, I think, a very very important area of exploration for him. Ultimately, being part of his own history, of course. Next slide. In the, at, the, at the same time, um, Mike was asked to write about Paul Tech, and this is a, a picture of the Paul Tech meat piece. And um, so, uh, so Mike wrote one of his most brilliant essays about tech and about how tech, working in the 60s, working against minimalism, against Larry Bell, against Andy Warhol, and introducing this sort of putrid uh, flesh facsimile um, as, as a kind of confrontation against all this kind of purified, um, more commercially acceptable work that was going on in the 60s. This was the, this was the 60s that Mike wanted to identify with, and so he became a huge champion of Paul Tech. And this is, this is also all between this, in this very short period of 1988 to 93 when he's working um, on his own retrospective. Next slide. Um, it was a very dense couple of years uh, for me. I started to work with Mike when I was a curator at the ICA in Boston, but then I ended up moving to New York. And I had decided while in Boston to do this show with Mike. And when I moved to New York, I decided to bring the show to New York. But in the meantime, I got um, sidelined into doing being the head curator on the 1993 Whitney Biennial, which turned out to be um, a sort of loaded, politically active moment in the history of biennials. It was um, probably more um, disliked than any biennial of, of current memory. It had a lot of people who were in it whose uh, political involvement was what Mike would have called agit prop. And, uh, and, but nonetheless, my team of curators and I wanted to put that kind of art forward. We thought it was the right thing at that time, and so, and so we did. And um, there was a lot of work that related to race, to um, sexuality, to gender issues, you name it. All the hot buttons of the moment were very much in your face in that biennial. Well, Mike was sitting on the sidelines and working with me on his own show, which was supposed to open um, four months later, and he couldn't stand the idea that he couldn't have get into the action and have something to say in the midst of all these, these, uh, these radical artists. So he came forth with um, a couple of these banners, which were signature work of his, where he, he claimed, he always claimed that he had found these uh, the, the text somewhere, and that he hadn't made a thing up, and that he was just going to sort of reproduce it in his own form, which was this kind of Sister Corita banner form. And so this he hung very prominently right by the entry desk, desk um, to the Whitney Museum. And of course, you know, he was having his fun with the content of the show um, with this. this. But then, um, next slide. Uh, then, then he really, we got into Catholic tastes. Um, it, was, it was a hard exhibition to convince anybody in New York to do. People really didn't know his work. 
um, they didn't think, uh, they, they really honestly just couldn't understand uh, what he was doing. A lot of it had been performance-based and nobody in uh, very few of those performances, almost none, had come to New York. So this was a really um, a time for him to sort of introduce himself to, the, to a, a wider public than Los Angeles where they had really seen his work. And he had just had this experience of being in Europe for the first time. So this was a, a big job and the putting together of the catalog was just as huge for him as the putting together of the show. So um, this is his way of telling us in the catalog, this was published in the catalog, that this was going to be about Mike. Next slide. Next slide. That was the cover. So all of these um, pieces from his, what, whatever he had done um, in terms of installations, performance props, and so on, came into the show. And he was, he, the, the checklists were enormous. Um, everybody who worked with Mike in those early days, all the Metro Pictures shows, everyone tells the same story of the immensity of the, of the lists and the things that wanted to go into the show. And it was, it was totally alarming to think how much was going to go. And this was into the Whitney's largest exhibition space, the fourth floor. So I'll um, just flip through a few of these very quickly. This is uh, the room with the performance props. Go on. Next slide. These pieces are upstairs. These are the sculptures that have been in Documenta just the year before the show, the Kalima table and the, um, the or Orgone box, I think it's called. These, incidentally, um, just like Crawl Worm, where the spectator is supposed to crawl into the piece, Ideally, I always thought that these pieces, the spectator was supposed to enter and actually sit in and experience, but to my knowledge, at least during the Catholic taste run, nobody ever went inside of one of these sculptures, and I don't think anybody's going inside of them here at PS1 either. Next slide. This is, this is there was this huge backspace of the fourth floor of the Whitney that was totally given over to the half a man stuffed animals work. And it was, um, he had finished doing it. He was absolutely sick of being identified with, with this kind of work, but it was gorgeously displayed. I just want to back up for a minute to tell you a little bit about um, the putting the catalog together. This was very, very seriously uh, considered by him. He only wanted people to write other than you know, one or two of us who hadn't been in LA. He only wanted people from LA to write. And so he, he very, very carefully asked the people who had, um, who had been involved with him uh, from his CalArts days. And so um, the people who were asked were uh, Kim Gordon, uh, Ralph Rugoff, uh, Paul Schimmel, um, Colin Gardner, Dennis Cooper, was asked, um, and um, Howard Singerman. So th these were all people who had actually seen uh, Mike do his performances and who could give some sort of firsthand account of what he had done in these early performances and installations in LA. And I think uh, we're very, very indebted to Mike uh, for kind of bringing that group of essays together because they're, they're just there finally uh, as some sort of easily available um, do documentation of what happened. Um, the only exception to this was that he allowed this writing about Detroit to take place because he was beginning, because he was going from beginning to end um, mid-career history of his work in the show, he began to think of the earliest, uh, the earliest days of it. And so Detroit came in, uh, Dave Marsh, who was a, somebody who had been an editor of Cream Magazine in Detroit, wrote an essay on Mike Kelly in Detroit. And actually Kim Gordon uh, talked about Mike's Detroit, the end of the utopia of the 60s is what she called it, and the time of the kind of freaky um, performance people, Iggy Pop and Alice Cooper, that were so important to him in his career. I just, this, this is Monkey Island. Next slide. Lump and Pearl, which is upstairs. It's great to look at these slides and then look at the installation um, at PS1 because uh, this is Mike's installation of his own work. He was really totally involved um, with getting that checklist into shape and then dealing with, with the space when he came into it. And um, so 
all of the hanging is absolutely his. Next slide. So just to give you an idea of some of the images that were beginning to come up um, in the work on this catalog, this is uh, from the MC5. This John Sinclair was involved with this group, and he was, uh, at the end of the 60s, arrested for marijuana possession. And he had been, this MC5 group had been really important to Mike when he was growing up, and this is what he would argue about them being more important than the Sex Pistols and, and Detroit being more important than Paris and so on. So this was the kind of stuff that he would talk to you about all the time. Uh, fast forward. Um, this is a couple of years later, after the, uh, the Catholic Tastes Open, uh, Mike made Education Complex. I saw it at Metro Pictures, and I bought it for the Whitney. I was, I don't know why, it just, just uh, I think because we had talk so much about his history and his background and this, which is a collection of the models of all the places he could remember and then the blank spaces of all the places he forgot about his own education from kindergarten through CalArts. This piece just spoke to me enormously and I bought it. And I, looking at it recently in the show and again, I'm struck again by the crawl worm aspects of this piece because if you look at it, you see there's a mattress under it. If you go upstairs, you can see that. And when Mike made this piece and first showed it at Metro Pictures, people actually could crawl under it and lie down on that mattress, and they did. I never did. But if you did, you could look up into the bottom of that piece, and connected to the bottom of the piece is actually another uh, a model of another space, and that space is CalArts. And you can only see that if you go under the piece. So uh, this piece has been called his iconic piece. It's a very diagrammatic piece. It's a very sober piece uh, compared to the work in Half a Man. And um, it's, it's extremely meaningful. It really was the basis for all the repressed memory work that is in Day and Don and, and that we'll be talking about later this afternoon. So it's a, a seminal piece for Mike Kelly. What's interesting to me is that it has this, uh, this, this perversion in it, if you like, the fact that you, know, you have to really look at it from the bottom, from, from the rear, from the underneath part, which is so typical of Mike, and yet once Mike became a famous man and his work went into the Whitney Museum, it was over. The perverse, I mean, the perverse, the perversion of this piece has never been totally realized because uh, nobody is allowed to do what I've just described. When it's gone into a museum, it's too risky to the piece, and uh, so the piece has lost a certain amount of its character as intended by, by the artist. Next slide. That's Detroit. So Detroit, after 95, I think after the experience of Catholic taste, Detroit became much more interesting. And that's my segue into uh, Mobile Homestead. He was born outside of Detroit, Mike was. He went to the University of Michigan. He was a teenager, young teenager, during these, these terrible race riots. He saw the whole downward spiral of Detroit, and he returned to it, he returned to his, the, in, in his imagination, he constantly went back to it. I think that, um, he, that the Catholic taste gave him a sense that his great subject matter at that point in his life was going to be the exploration of his own history, and I think he, play, he played that out for the next 10 or 15 years. So, next slide. Mobile Homestead was the end of it, as it turned out. And um, it's playing, the videos, uh, what survives of Mobile Homestead, which I'll just tell you a little bit about, are uh, this replica of Mike Kelly's childhood home. Um, there were, um, this replica was made. There were three videos made of the replica moving in, into, and out of Detroit. And uh, there's a third video that was um, shot at the inauguration when this piece was introduced. This, the idea for this was that um, uh, a uh, London uh, public art uh, group 
called Art Angel, was, had decided it would do its first public artwork outside of the UK, and they asked Mike to do it. Mike decided he would do this in Detroit, and what he wanted to do was to go back to the, the town that he was born in, to the house that he lived in, and to buy that house and to turn it into some kind of a community center public space. So he failed. He, the people, the person who was living in that house refused to sell it to him. And so his idea was if it wouldn't be sold to him that he would remake it. So he remade a complete replica of, of, that, um, of that home. And th that's what you, you see here. This is the, you can see his own home in the background. Next slide. But the idea was more complicated than that because he wanted the, um, the replica to be able to be mobile, to move around, to park anywhere it wanted to around the city and the environs to function as a kind of community space. But he also wanted to park the mobile home someplace permanently and to build un underneath the, mo the mobile home two levels of subterranean spaces that would be totally private and inaccessible. So there would be two things going on, a public space above and a private space below. And the private space would only be available to Mike or to Mike's designated visitors. So this, this plan was very ambitious, very metaphorical, very, very important to Mike, and as it turns out, horribly hard to pull off. It was uh, Art Angel, um, it, was, it was beyond people's means, that's the easiest way to say it. Detroit was just going out of business, literally. It was very, very hard to, um, to raise the funds and to sort of bring all the people together necessary to work on it, and so this went on and on. Um, next slide. What did happen was that they, the Art Angel was able to sponsor the movement of the mobile home into Detroit and outside, and Mike was able to um, produce, edit, and in a sense direct the videos that I've described to you. And very cleverly, he decided from the beginning that he would interview people all along that street that the mobile home was moving into and out of. So, um, next slide. These are stills that, um, that exist from the 2012 Biennial Catalog, uh, which show a still from all the, the interviews that took place. And the interviews, um, when you see them in the videos, are almost like cinema verite. They're very straightforward. They ask people to tell their stories, and they are all reflective individually and cumulatively of what it's like to live in Detroit at this moment in time. They're incredibly straightforward. Mike was very involved in devising the questions and choosing, for the most part, all the subjects of the interviews. But um, when it came to actually being the interviewer, he didn't do it. He stayed in Los Angeles and this very nice British woman from the UK was in Detroit. She would shoot every day and send, the, send what she had taken to Mike and Mike would edit it and direct her how to do it better the next time. But what he surmised was that she was a nice woman who was unthreatening and coming in and she was, these people were delivering to her incredibly poignant interviews. Had he been the person doing the interviewing, they would have been more indirect, probably more cynical. But when these interviews came back, he really, uh, he really got into them. He thought they were very moving and very, very good. So the, um, the videos that he put together and that you will have a chance to see if you go into the city are quite, quite, um, quite moving. In the interviews are moving and then the whole view of the mobile home moving through the city is very, very moving. And um, the song that Mike has written to uh, accompany this, which is played, it's called Going Home, is also very, very moving. Um, however, Mike, um, Mike died. 
and he died before this, this piece could finally be uh, finished in all the ways that he had planned for it. Next slide. He did go to the inauguration, and you see him there. Next slide. And he did get to see his friend John Sinclair again. He's the, from the MC5, the tall guy with the white beard. Next slide. And this is the, the last slide. Um, again, when I was um, looking at this group of slides and putting them together, I thought, well, I'm finishing just where I began because the, this crawl space, this, these, are, this is, these are the, the cellars that were being built to go under Mobile Homestead where it was finally going to be parked, which was at MOCAD in Detroit. And the, the cellars were built, they were excavated, and here you see this happening. But again, you see there's the crawl space, there's the, un the underground, there's the, the, uh, the, uh, the secret space of, of uh, Mike Kelly, which keeps cropping up. Um, I think this, the legacy of this last work is very complicated, and, um, and we have to keep digging into it to see what, what Mike wanted, where he might have been going, and um, I just have some idea of that from what he wrote for the Biennial Catalog, which was written just maybe a month before he died, but I'll read it to you because I think it's so great what he had to say about his own last work. As public art, this is Mike, intended to have some positive effect, effect on the community in proximity to it, it is a total failure. Detroit is a poor city and I don't believe that the funding exists to organize the social programs associated with the project or even to cover the operating costs of Mobile Homestead. The work could become just another ruin in a city of ruins. Yet in the beginning, I never intended the, the project to have any positive effect. Turning my childhood home into an art gallery community center was simply a sign for social concern performed in bad faith. The project, in its initial conception, expressed my true feelings about the milieu in which I was raised and my belief that, the, that one always has to hide. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Joe Scanlon. I'm director of the Visual Arts Program at Princeton, and I want to thank MoMA PS1 for being interested and willing to put this education program together with us today. Uh, and I want to thank my colleagues at the Lewis Center as well, down at Princeton. Our next speaker, uh, one of the great things about being in academia is that there are all kinds of people with all kinds of interests just down the hall or across the quad or, in this case, in the office next door. Stacy Wolf is a professor of theater at Princeton, and I knew from the moment I arrived there that she was a scholar of what you might call debased theater, Broadway musicals, uh, community theater, uh, amateur theater. And when the Mike Kelly show was coming to town, I thought, oh, Stacy, you have to speak about your research in relation to Mike's interest in the very same subjects. So Stacy was a willing scholar and ethnographer, and I'm happy that she's here today. She's the author of two books. Uh, the first, Changed for Good, A Feminist History of the Broadway Musical, published by Oxford in 2011. And her first book, A Problem Like Maria, Gender and Sexuality in the American Musical, published by Michigan in 2002. So please join me in welcoming Stacy Wolf. Hi, is this working? Yes, oh my gosh, okay. It picks you up farther. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk and Joe for that lovely introduction. Am I good? Am I too high? Am I too low? Okay. 
One of the great pleasures of my job is being in the office next to Joe and seeing all the work that he does. I want to thank Jenny and Alex for all their work, as well as Mike and Steve for their tech help, and Katie Welsh, my fantastic research assistant who helped me uh, make these images look as cool as they're going to look. Sounds of birds chirping. Opening shot of a school exterior. Train whistle blows. Funky music in. Lights up on a school hallway. The educational complex. Tile floors. Cement walls. Harsh fluorescent lighting. Enter from the far end of the hallway. Three young women dressed identically in black leotards and stirrup style tights. Thin gold chain around their waists. Hair tied back, faces covered with clown white makeup, dancing the pony in a line. Their step-all changing legs and rotating arms move in imperfect unison. On their faces, a glimmer of a self-satisfied smirk. They traverse the school's hallways, the music piped in through the PA system. This is Mike Kelly's Day is Done, Extracurricular Activity Projective Reconstruction Number 2, Train Dance. Another school. You see the similarly nondescript building from the parking lot as you look for the building's entrance. Let's go in. Tile floors, cement walls, harsh fluorescent lighting. Walk down this little hallway and push through the double doors. An auditorium, a theater. Not quite new carpet on the floor. Rows of seats, maybe 200 of them. Mostly empty, but a few occupied near the front. Other seats filled with backpacks and coats and crumpled fast food bags. The stage is lit, but the house lights are up as well. A piano plays, a vamp. Enter from stage left, three young women dress I dressed identically in black leotards, hair tied back, faces covered with clown white makeup. They move center, glance at one another, take a breath, and start to sing. This is a dress rehearsal for the Pentington Players Community Theater 2012 production of Pippin. Mike Kelly's remarkable, exhilarating, unnerving piece invites a conversation with actual extracurricular activities, the church pageants, talent shows, dance recitals, and assemblies whose yearbook photos were his source material. From everyday scenes captured in black and white, Kelly wrote new scenarios, many with music, that are sometimes touching, frequent, frequently pornographic, and usually sinister. The exhibit bombards the audience with what critic Carly Berwick calls the dissonant sounds and images of manic church sing-alongs and campy high school theater. As a theater and performance studies scholar currently researching and writing about amateur musical theater, that is musical theater at high schools, community theaters, non-equity dinner theaters, Jewish community centers, churches, and summer camps, I find Day is Done mesmerizing and confounding, its images weirdly familiar and incomprehensibly strange. Kelly's piece extracts the dark underbelly of the kinds of seemingly innocent performances that I've witnessed and attended and talked to people about for the past 18 months. How can Day is Done serve as a productive jumping off point for thinking about the actual extracurricular activity of community musical theater? Let's first note the fundamental differences between Day is Done and my subject. First, Kelly's piece is a completed multimedia installation. The scenes, acts, and production numbers, as he calls them, are technologically mediated. Viewers can also see the film or photographs in the catalog. Community theater, in contrast, is live performance. Its experience is one time only, ephemeral. Its documentation, which you'll see shortly, is flawed and illegal. If you miss Kelly's show, you can get a sense of it by buying the book or renting the film. If you miss this production of Pippin, you missed it. In Day is Done, viewers create their own journey through the show. Kelly hoped that they would, as he puts it, intuit some kind of narrative flow, but like a musical, he writes, it doesn't really matter if one follows the logic or not. 
Still, this is a key difference between an installation, which one experiences in a fragmented associative order, and an actual musical play, which moves chronologically. In addition, Day is Done is ironic, dark, ominous, and edgy. Community theater is earnest, lighthearted, utopian in impulse, and naive in its directness. Kelly presents surprising juxtapositions, while community theater embodies what many see as predictable cliches. And of course, we come at the subject from opposite perspectives. I'm a critic, scholar, ethnographer, and he's an artist. What we have in common is a fascination with the musical and with the amateur. Kelly calls Day is Done a kind of fractured feature-length musical. A critic from, Electro from Electronic Arts Intermix describes it as a carnivalesque opus, a genre-smashing epic. John C. Welchman sees it as a cross between low-end community theater, free-fall for all pen free fall pantomime, and an off-Broadway musical. Each segment, that is, each numbered reconstruction, is made up of musical theater's elements of music and lyrics, acting and choreography, costume and set design. As for the amateur, Kelly opened a window onto these performances that have been happening everywhere, but that no one has paid attention to. They're not typical subjects for art. Here today, I want to share some of my research through the lens of Day is Done. I want to metaphorically pull Kelly's characters out of the frame and into their everyday experiences as amateur performers. What are the real lived stories of people's extracurricular activities? The label amateur, whose etymological root is the word love, is met with eye-rolling disdain in the US. Still, the amateur is Kelly's subject, and in musical theater, the person who is the lifeblood of the form. Broadway, a cultural site that likely meets with equal eye rolling in a place like MoMA PS1, but go with me here, is presumed to be the center of musical theater, but in fact, non-professional theaters across the country ultimately sustain Broadway. This happens in three ways. First, there would be no Broadway artists if not for amateur musical theater. Almost every professional actor, director, choreographer, and designer participated in high school community or summer camp musicals before making their way to New York or LA. Second, there would be no Broadway audience. A vast number of spectators to, at Broadway musicals participate in or attend local amateur productions. There they fall in love with musical theater and learn the repertoire. Third, licensing companies gain a considerable profit, a full 50% through amateur musicals. Even a musical that financially fails on Broadway, which most do, can make back its investment through years of high school and community shows. The oldest operating, the oldest continuously operating community theater in the United States is the Footlight Club in Jamaica Plain near Boston, which was founded in 1877. The term community theater was coined in 1917 by Louise Burley, a playwright, director, and activist. She and other advocates believed that community theater offered a unique opportunity for the masses to be civically engaged through active participation in art. Fellow proselytizer Percy McKay, for example, described community theater as a civic festival, a ritual of democratic religion, a plastic, aspiring, playful, creative, childlike, religious instinct. To follow Kelly's organizational framework and to put his subjects in mind in a kind of art theater duet, I'll discuss three of his images and for each share one from my own research to propose some thematic echoes. My examples today are taken from one of my book's case studies, a consortium of 10 community theaters, some of which have been around since the early 1950s, that rehearse and perform at the Kelsey Theater on the campus of the Mercer County Community College, which is located around 20 minutes from where I teach at Princeton. Each group produces two shows a year, either a musical or a straight play. Add to this season the three shows that the college produces and various kids' shows, and this theater is used an incredible 50 weekends a year. Project One, Bodies. 
In extracurricular activity projective reconstruction number two, train dance, Kelly restages a photograph of three high school age girls. His performers dance through the halls of a building at CalArts where he filmed to alert the institutional workers who participate in the various extracurricular activities. We hear the Chugga Chugga song, but they don't move their mouths because, as Kelly explains, their mimes and sing telepathically. In addition to this humorous detail, their dance is charming in a cheesy way. The women wear stereotypical da jazz dance garb, and their faces call up associations with mimes, but also with musicals like Cabaret, Pippin, and Chicago. Their attitude is serious, but not somber, and their dance done with casual investment, neither overtly sexualized nor avoiding the body's display. The choreography re relies on simple cliched steps, like the pony, and their rotating arms literalize the train reference. These are the first steps taught in a jazz class, a less respected form of dance than modern or, of course, ballet, and is the training style for Broadway choreography. These women could easily dance from this school to the Pennington Players production of Pippin. We're going to look at a clip from the opening of Pippin as the cast enters the stage one by one. As you'll see, Nicole, the show's choreographer, makes use of Bob Fosse's movement vocabulary from the 1972 Broadway production, which has been so thoroughly absorbed into our culture that we can't remember when it was new and weird and ugly. Nicole stages flexed feet, jutting hips, body parts rotating in isolation, and of course the ubiquitous jazz hands, and she couples this style with ballet. Note the range of choreography for different performers. Some repeat one movement, and others follow a constantly changing series of steps. Also pay attention to the range of how comfortable the performers are in their bodies. For dance auditions for the show, Nicole, who's a high school drama teacher by day, created a complicated combination, which she taught very quickly. When I talked to her about the audition process, she said, I want to see who can pick up steps fast, but more importantly, I want to see who can perform enthusiastically and with fake confidence, even if they don't know what they're doing. Because performers need to sing too, she casts dancers of vastly different abilities. 
She creates challenging choreography because she wants the trained dancers to show off their stuff. When I asked her about the one obvious non-dancer in the cast, she told me she has a strong voice and we needed her, but I'm afraid that I didn't know how uncomfortable she would be wearing skimpy clothes and having to move. I worry this has been an awkward and not very fun experience for her. Unlike a dance class, the rehearsal process is focused on the production with little time for skill building, but Nicole creates a gentle and encouraging environment. She understands the performer's fragility, their physical and emotional vulnerability in rehearsal, which is all about making mistakes. She said, in our world where so few experiences are live, it's scary to be up there doing a show. Anything can happen. Project two, extracurricular. In extracurricular projective reconstruction number nine, Farm Girl, Kelly infuses the piece with unsettling juxtapositions. The costume, gingham and overalls, looks like she's in the cast of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. The set, an outline of a suburban tract house, looks like an underfunded production. The performer's expression wavers between seduction and mania, and her singing combines yodeling and rock. Her movement merges jazz with a stripper's stride. But I'm also interested in her investment and groundedness in the, her performance. She's focused, present, a thoroughly confident embodiment, including the gleam in her eye. In the clip I'll show next, from the opening song of playful theater production's Little Shop of Horrors, you'll see some surprising resemblance to Farm Girl emerge. First, you'll see some similar choreography. You'll also see how completely, how completely the actors are engaged in the performance, what pleasure they take in performing. The number feels both staged and improvised. They inject some ad-libbed sounds and really own the choreography. Like the farm girl, they're trying to seduce the audience. big up there, <laughs> now that I'm turning around. For actors who do community theater, their involvement in this extracurricular activity is significant and satisfying. It's an artistic practice that involves considerable time and effort. 
In the 21st century US, especially for women who frequently carry more of the household responsibilities, participating in a hobby, as it might be called, could be seen as a radical act. Community theater actors participate for several reasons. Sometimes it's the specific show that draws them. Auditions for a forthcoming production of Les Miserables, it's the first community theater production in the area because the amateur rights have just been released, drew a record-breaking 175 people, or three times as many people as typically audition. As one producer told me, it's Les Mis, everyone knows it and everyone wants to do it. We could have cast the show five times over, she said. People who would typically be cast in leading roles in another show barely made the chorus in this one. For those who audition and participate regularly, who are the majority of the performers, some, like Nakima, standing here far right, see community theater as the training ground for what she hopes will be a career in music or theater. She attends the community college and auditions for everything. For Tia, in green with arms raised, who works full time as a social worker and is finishing her master's degree, community theater connects her to her earlier life. She tells me about her ex-husband who didn't understand why she wanted to perform and proudly shows me photos of her kids. The 14 year old does her homework during the 10 out of 12 tech rehearsal. Tia says, my kids are great. They know I need to do this. It's a lot of time, but I need to do this. And for Maria, pictured here, community theater is an integral part of her life. She doesn't take dance or voice or acting lessons, she says, because she more enjoys being in a show. She told me, I like to go from one show to the next, auditioning and rehearsing and performing. Little Shop was especially fun for her because she had the lead and because her father, a retired high school principal, was in the cast too. For all of these women, the love of performing beckons them and keeps them coming back for more. Whatever their circumstances, many actors express the same sentiment. They do community theater to survive. For many of the backstage team, the pleasure of community theater is being a part of the process. As Ruth, one of the producers of Little Shop, confessed to me in a whisper, I probably shouldn't say this, but I really don't care about the performance. I mostly love the rehearsals. I love watching the show get built day by day. I've watched Frank direct so many shows, and I never get tired of seeing it come together. Honestly, when it's ready and performed, I'm not that interested anymore. The more I talk to people, the more I understand that it's nearly impossible to disentangle their investments, though for all of them, community, theat community musical theater is entirely serious and important. It's not just artistry, not just performance, not just wanting friends. And with a musical, a collaborative beast much bigger than a non-musical show, the risks and rewards are especially high. Though extracurricular to their school or day job or parenting, musical theater is central to these amateur artists' identities. It shapes their lives and makes them a part of a subculture. In a capitalist post-Fordist economy, the non-productive volunteer labor of community musical theater is surely deviant. Project three, emulation. In extracurricular activity, projective reconstruction number 28, nativity play, Kelly restages the annual ritual of the school pageant. Even Jews like me know the story, and the set and costumes are familiar, predictable, cliche. Interestingly though, this particular copy is less exact than the others in the exhibit. The kids don't look like the photo, especially the little one in the middle. The photo, as a perfect, perfectly imperfect reproduction, becomes a kind of Brechtian gesture foregrounding Kelly's process of emulation. Amateur community musicals also strive to emulate the original. The next clip is a scene that's familiar to musical theater aficionados, the end of act one of Stephen Sondheim's Sunday in the Park with George. Some things to note. The character of George is active here, showing the other characters to their places. Their faces are impassive and expressionless, Sometimes the characters move on their own, as if by an outside force. 
the tableau is finished in the last swelling phrase of the song. And George makes two small changes at the very last moment. He turns a seated woman around and removes the little girl's glasses. This number, as James Lapine staged it on Broadway in 1984, went pretty much like this, with the actors starting in one place and slowly moving to another as the Surratt painting gradually comes into focus. For Pinworth Productions director Lou Stallworth, the goal was to imitate the production, that production, as exactly as possible. He told me before rehearsals began, the closer we can get to the Broadway production, the happier I'll be. The community theater, the community musical theater artist doesn't reinvent or deconstruct. Creativity means emulation, and artistry means copying well. Nicole choreographs Pippin to look like Bob Fosse. Kat, Nakiema, and Tia sing Little Shop of Horrors to sound like the 1983 cast album. Set and costume designer Kate Pinner paints a flat to look like a Sunday afternoon of the Grand, on the Grand Jatte, but her reference isn't the painting, but rather Tony Strages's Tony Award-winning design. If the emulation is successful, the audience takes pleasure in having their memories, real or imagined, confirmed. The paired photos in Day is Done show us the original and Kelly's reconstruction. Community musical theater as a reconstruction is ghosted by the original production, but it's long gone. No one can compare them. And yet, the experience for everyone involved is unique and new and doesn't feel like a repetition of someone else's performance. The practice of making performance is creative, invigorating, and enormously pleasurable. As I continue my research and strive for an ethical engagement with and generous representation of my subjects and their stories, Kelly's Day is Done productively tempers my utopian impulse. Its dark violence and foreboding atmosphere remind me that the dynamics of community theater, like any community, can be fraught, damaging, and of course involve power and authority. In the end, I'm ambivalent about what I can understand about Kelly's attitude towards his subjects in Day is Done. Is he mocking them, honoring them, trying to give them a bigger story than the photographs that were his source material? And how do these characters coexist in the larger gallery space, in the total musical of Day is Done? However Kelly's edginess challenges my optimism, I'm intrigued by his deep engagement with the form of the musical, which points to his seriousness about the genre. To be able to show the darkly comic perversity, Kelly lived with the material. The very attention that he paid to the amateur artist opens a conversation between art and theater, which is far more useful than most theater scholars' out-of-hand dismissal. Community musical theater gets a bad rap in the US, and the folks who participate at Kelsey are well aware of the condescending associations of this activity that gives them great pleasure. My own goal as I move forward, now with Day is Done as a companion, is to advocate for the value of the amateur and of community musical theater. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for Q&A. Thank, thanks very much for um, both of the papers. I um, thought they were terrific. Um, my question is for uh, Stacy. Um, and it, it's a question about, well, it's actually two parts, maybe. Um, I, I'm wondering first. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see where you are. I'm here. Oh, hi. Yeah. Oh, hi. it's John. Hello. It is, yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm wondering if you had any comments on the sort of cultural shift that was ushered in in amateur performativity beginning, I guess, in a sort of strong way in the 90s, as the things invested in community-type theater shifted over to the more immediate practices of karaoke and sort of one-line stand-up singing and the stuff that went on you know, soon after at the end of the 90s on YouTube. Because it seems that a lot of things have been peeled away and cast out of 
the real elaborate setup scenarios that you were talking about and, and giving us some great detail about and that Mike himself uh, drew upon because most of his examples are drawn from yearbooks and newspapers going back to, actually, he corrected me when I once suggested that they were time specific. Apparently they range right across the sort of middle part of the 20th century. So there are some things that go back, I guess, to the 40s and 50s and some other things that would be more contemporary with his own upbringing in the 60s and 70s. But I just wondered if you had any comments about that, that shift, because it seems a quite a profound one. And a lot of things are sort of surrendered and lost, I think, in amateur performativity by the move. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's such a, a lovely and generous question. I think when I first saw Kelly's, Kelly's exhibit, I was struck by how much it actually speaks directly to my people. And I think this sense of anachronism or something old-fashioned or old is really what, what the people who I'm studying are very much involved in. And the way that YouTube and these other kinds of ways in which everyone is an amateur and everyone is performing now mostly is use useful to them because it's more stuff for them to steal so they can figure out exactly how to show their stuff. And it's also made, made the illegality of all of these tapes that they make of their performances which are completely and totally illegal. You cannot cannot film any licensed production, but they do anyway, as you see, and lend out their materials to scholars who are writing about them. Um, and I think with the proliferation of all kinds of things on YouTube, they feel freer to do that. Um, but I think it's, it's a great question because the people who I've spoken to really don't see themselves as people who sit in their bedrooms and make um, sometimes quite amazing pieces of art that are then distributed over the internet. They are very committed and dedicated to uh, live performance and to people showing up and to this very old, what many people see as very old fashioned sense of the community and community theater. Um, and the theater that I'm studying, people, families have been there and people have worked there for generations, uh, adults and children. And so there's, there is something very out of step in some way with the examples that you give, which I find quite um, fascinating and inspiring as well. Thanks for that question. It was great. Yeah. So what do you draw from community theater that you're studying as it reflects America, American values? Are they changing? Um, you know, so what are you, you know, you've talked about your research in relation to his work, but what does your research inform you of? What do you draw from community theater? What does it show us? Um, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, thank you so much. Well, I should say, first of all, I'm, because I'm in the, in the middle of the beginning of this project, I would say that I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that answer yet. When I have the full answer, uh, my book will be finished. Right now, I would say um, two main things. First, the point that I made um, early in the talk that Broadway professional theater would not exist without community theater, that people, that professional artists disparage, I would say, at their peril. And um, my colleagues in, in the land where I live, in the land of theater history and theater criticism, no one cares at all. No one thinks this is interesting, valuable, or worth studying. It's really only anthropologists and sociologists and ethnomusicologists who are interested in this form that ultimately sustains the professional theater. And if Broadway is to, it is to continue, if musical theater is to continue, which I think it can and should as one of the commercial forms of entertainment in this country, we very much need to pay attention to what's happening on the level of the community theater and the non-professional. I also think um, one of the things that it says about American culture is that people still crave the live and being together in a room, together making something and the pleasure of seeing words on a page and musical notes on a score and figuring out how to bring that to life and actually doing it together at once, um, I think is really, really important for people's lives. I am sure that those reasons have changed over the course of the 20th century and how that, how that has changed exactly, that I'm not quite sure of yet, but that it matters today I think is enormously important. So thanks for that question. Um, hi, this is actually a question for Elizabeth. 
following up on something, Stacy, that you talked about in terms of the attitude of Mike Kelly to his subjects, and you were posturing whether it was cynical or supportive. Elizabeth, I wonder if you could comment on your thoughts about Mike's last film and the interviews that he did with various subjects and what you felt um, came across in terms of his attitude towards his subjects. It's funny because I was thinking the same thing, <laughs> Donna, <laughs> of, um, that these, the, uh, my ending my talk with um, Mobile Homestead and those interviews and then Stacy sort of talking about the kind of earnestness behind the, the uh, community theater that he seems to be involved with. Uh, both these things, uh, both uh, my suggestion, I, I, I can answer you about the, what I think Mike's involvement was with the interviews, but um, I, th I think that's what makes us edgy and interested about Mike Kelly, is that, is he cynical? Is he making these people look ridiculous? Is he making them look like failures in the case of the mobile homestead people? Um, is he uh, just going for the jugular and just really making everybody uncomfortable by how silly they look being a farm girl? Or is he, go is he simultaneously going for a, a sort of humanist, reading of his subject matter and you know the wonders of participation and so on and um, of course it's you know it's neither one or the other it's all mixed up and t and twisted together and um, that's what I think is um, is interesting and will be continuously interesting about Mike's work in terms of mobile homestead I mean all the clues I can get are that he gave the, the interviewer this chance to do the interviews and they came back and he was um, surprised I mean he would have called the bluff of these people he would have gotten into an argument with them about something he would have found them ridiculous I mean this is all possible or I mean we don't know he could have just completely fallen for their pathos if you like or their we, we just don't know but but the fact that he let them out and that he seems to have been surprised by their power suggests that there was something else going on there. And that's what I meant to say when I said I think the legacy of Mobile Homestead is going to be debated for a long time. So, yeah. When I, when I was first saying that I'm an ethnographer and Kelly wasn't, I was thinking he actually was an ethnographer very, very much. Uh, hi. Um, and this is, again, for Stacy. Um, I remember a really long time ago, I think Cristal, the, uh, the former owner of CBGB's, um, saying that like the rise of bands was very specific to areas that re you, you needed to like create a community, kind of like to withstand what was going on around you. And I can definitely very much see that with um, a group like the MC5 uh, it happening in Detroit, um, kind of like the backdrop for Mike Kelly's uh, coming into his own. Um, I was kind of wondering, like on that wavelength, were you noticing there being any like um, any like similarities between the areas that kind of like were fostering um, like a community theater? Is there like anything that links them apart from that? They have the theaters. That that's it's such a great question, and it's incredibly. Okay, I'm way too short to do this. Okay, I know I'm insanely tall now, but this this feels more comfortable for me because I can actually see you. Um, that's such a great question, and it's act and it's something that I'm very much in the process of investigating because I've traveled all over the country talking to people, and one of the things that's most fascinating about community theaters is that they are in every single part of the country. No matter how much money people do or don't make, race, socioeconomic, rural, urban, every, virtually every small town in the United States has some kind of community theater. And the question is whether or not they actually pay for the rights of the shows that they do, and many of them, for good reason, don't. Um, because rights are very expensive, um, even for very small companies. And so the Broadway musical is 
one of America's quote unquote native uh, forms of culture and it really does form a national culture. And now again, getting back to John's question about YouTube and the proliferation of videos that are free and available all the time, People know uh, musical theater very well, even if they've never been to Broadway, and that people were breathlessly awaiting the release of Les Mis, even before Les Mis was a movie, everyone knew what it was because they had already um, seen it on, seen illegal clips on, on YouTube. So um, one of the things that I'm trying to figure out is how the particularities, especially of economics, function at the different theaters that I've been studying, how it is, because I'm, I find it quite remarkable and um, extraordinary that even in, in these small places um, where people really have, r really people are struggling to survive, they still are making community theater and they're still doing Bye Bye Birdie, which is really amazing. To get you to focus on before, and I think the question goes to both of you. What's the role of community theater in America? What does it show us about the society? And your point about is he cynical? I mean, why would you be cynical about it? I mean, a lot of people in America appear to like it, and it wouldn't exist if people didn't go to it and support it. So I thought what your research was going to head to was, well, what's the role of the community theater in the community? What does it represent? And maybe that would answer the cynicism question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think um, it's, it's very refreshing to hear that, to hear that someone would say that anyone assumes that it's important because um, in, in my world, most people assume that it's not important. And so mostly what I'm having to do is just make an argument that it's a valid thing even to be interested and curious about. But I, I think the question of how, how do these people give back to the community, what does musical theater have to do with the community, the community in which it's located, every specific community theater is in relation to the local place where it is, whether it's in the Midwest or the Northeast or the South or whatever the issues and concerns are of that community. It's a very much of a local practice. But I would love to hear um, Elizabeth talk about well, it's Kelly. It just, it just occurs to me that you just can't collapse uh, day is done into, a, you know, into yeah. the musical theater. I don't think Stacy's trying to say that. She's just trying to say that was part of the rich background that he was obviously aware of and drawing on. But there's a very, very important middle element here about day is done, and that is that it's about high school. And uh, for the most part, I think it's almost entirely sort of drawn from those kinds of productions, which are before people are studying to be a social worker and doing musical theater on the side. So I think you know, uh, Mike was a very specific player. I mean, he knew, the, he knew exactly what he was going for. And so I think it was really the fact that these people were in high school and, and doing these things and what, what theater or these roles meant to them in high school. Can you, can you, talk, can you talk about why he, um, I'm, I'm curious to um, hear you talk about why he used adult, I mean, he writes about using adult, intentionally using adult actors and why he did that and not high school age actors. I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. Do you, does anybody in the audience know anything about, I'm looking at you, John. <laughs> yeah. Are they Cal so. No, not, no. Mary, Mary Claire, do you have a Hi, I'm uh, Mary Claire. I work with Mike on Day is Done. You know, Mike always said, and I, I, I didn't quite believe him, that the, the subject of Day is Done, it was not high school. He sort of tried to downplay that, that that was the source material. And in fact, he had a large archive of other types of photographs from local newspapers, uh, from Detroit, for instance, and uh, which he hadn't quite gotten to in terms of these... Um, projections, if you will. So I think his choice to use the adult actors was to under, underscore that these were not about high school, you know, to kind of go against that straight interpretation. You know, I mean, they certainly um, deal with those high school, what he called rituals, you know, and he, he chose very specifically even sometimes areas of photographs. Um, and there were a mixture of um, types of photographs. He was very, very meticulous about categorizing this vast archive of photographs from, that he'd collected from uh, some were goths and vamps, some were uh, 
uh, theater, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on some of them, but he had very specific categories, and I, f I feel like he, in some ways, you know, your talk, Stacy, about the emulation, um, you know, there was emulation here, but also projection, and I think the freedom of an artist, you know, to project and use this source material is very, you know, obviously different from some of your subject matter, but, um, so he specifically cast adults to get away from this interpretation, and also he wanted, um, you know, actors who could, who could act, so in fact, he didn't go out of his way to um, hire amateurs, and frankly, as we progressed, he was frustrated, you know, and he wanted to, you know, get better actors, better singers, et cetera. So, and we used casting, you know, we couldn't afford to go to the high end of Hollywood, you know, and, and I don't think he would have wanted that anyway. I think he did enjoy the variety of actors that we got, but we used um, backstage casting, um, and we got a, quite a, an array of um, types of actors. So I, I hope that answers it to some yeah, degree. I, I just wanted um, to say something about the high school thing, though, because you can't throw it out. I mean, no, no, uh-uh, because that is, I mean, it's the origin of the aspiration. And I think he got it, he, that material in yearbooks and so on was kind of a real spark to him, even though the range is wider. It's not just about high school. I didn't mean to suggest that. But that is a very important stage of this role playing, I yeah, think. In the, of, uh, in the social fabric of America, I mean, it was very particular to high schools and how you are, you know, basically indoctrinated into many, you know, social rituals, um, et cetera. And I mean, he often talked about days done as, you know, about rituals. And, uh, you know, in that sense, it does cross into ethnography to some degree. You know, there's a little of that in all of Mike's work, I think. And the other part of this, I mean, you know, the question from the floor here and, and Stacey's, the way Stacey ended the, the talk on the, uh, you know, on the moral question um, and on the question of critique and cynicism versus optimism, uplift, emulation, uh, this is the question. Um, it's a hard question. Uh, it's the test of, of Mike's uh, work in general, like exactly on the fulcrum of this, of this, because there was a part of Mike who was uh, extraordinarily interested in and passionate about, supportive of, obsessed by uh, that aspect of, of popular culture that he configured as amateur auteurism, right? So amateur, amateurs in all kinds of capacities, you know, not just your flea market painter, which of course he was very interested in, but also the people that would stitch uh, all the soft toys together, um, you know, that comes out in more love hours. But also, I remember a ridiculous conversation I had with Mike once, which was so crazy, I never managed to get it into the interview that it was supposed to be part of. We exchanged about this, Stacey, I was kind of remembering. And, and Mike was going on and on about something to do with people sitting backstage in Hollywood copying movies, like moving a VHS copy onto another copy. And, and he had this theory about how creative this might have been, right? And how extraordinary invested the particular person in the booth was about doing this process and sat there day after day. And he, would, you know, he had half an hour of disquisition on this particular form of, of, of activity, which was essentially copying. And he was really, really interested in it. And so there's that side. But then we can't forget that the, the other side is, is really important too, because there is a sense in which the subject matter of what is performed by the amateur troops, whether high school or professional community or wherever they come from, particularly the religious subject matter. Um, and there's a lot of Mary, nativity, a lot of Christian and Catholic iconography because that's how Mike uh, grew up. But he made no bones about it. There was a sense in which he was aware that the subjects in process in the performances that he was simulating and recreating and projecting and fantasizing were caught up, in a sense, in misrepresentations, right? Things that were beyond them and bigger than them that they couldn't, in a sense, get their minds around, perhaps, or got their minds around in a very particular kind of way. And that was a part of it, too. So, there's all the pendulum swings in Mike's work, you know, from one sense of almost the moral propriety of amateur productions right the way 
through to this corrosive skepticism about the possibility of being to, able to act out outside of these structures that have already positioned you. Um, and, and you know, you see it in the mobile homestead videos. It's, it's, it's remarkable. I remember seeing the, for the first time, um, uh, fairly recently actually, uh, I saw the videos projected on the big screen in a cinema type uh, environment. And the audience reaction was so extraordinary because people were laughing. We had a long conversation afterwards about why, why people were laughing. It was, there were laughs of I, I, sort of ironic confirmation. There were laughs of sort of identity projection. There were, there were about 10 different kinds of laughs or, or, or noises maybe that came from the audience, which you couldn't really see in the art world context of these projections, right? In the black box situation or when you're standing in a room or when you're not sitting down and looking at it because you could really take in the whole narrative sequence. And I found that to be, in fact, the, the choreography of the laughters. That's where that piece dwelled for me finally. Um, we're a little behind schedule unless there are really, really urgent questions for Elizabeth and Stacy. I would suggest that we take a 10 minute break and resume here at three o'clock. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mike Kelly looking forward. And um, we're back, as you can tell, with a panel discussion with William Popel, Joe Scanlon, and Rachel Harrison. Um, putting the panel together, Joe and I um, decided not to go for artists who directly work with Kelly or were, were very directly um, influenced by him, but we rather thought of people who had a more indirect um, dialogue, or we thought so, with Kelly, and um, we were very glad that Pope Al and Rachel immediately said yes. Uh, we ask each of you to choose one work from Kelly and give a very, very short presentation just to start off the discussion. And um, after that, we'll have a little conversation among us, and then we'll open up for you and um, feel free to ask them questions. Uh, the first presentation is from Rachel. I'll give a very brief introduction. Rachel Harrison is a Brooklyn-based um, artist who works in the media of sculpture, photography, drawing, painting, and video. Her show, Fake Title, Turquoise Stained Altars for Burger Turner is currently on view at SMAC in Ghent. And she had other recent solo shows at the Kessner Gesellschaft, Whitechapel, Porticus, and Bard College. Her work is included in numerous national and international museum collections. Um, a full uh, bio on all, all people involved is in the program. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for coming. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, so um, I was, when, uh, a few months ago, I got an email from Joe and Jenny inviting me to be on this panel, and it was just so intimidating. And I was like, oh my god, Mike Kelly, where do you begin? Um, uh, what an amazing challenge to try to condense and collect thoughts of my favorite artist. So I'm setting my alarm, but I don't even know how to do that, because I'm only given five minutes, right? Three to five minute presentation for an artist so dense, so complex, whose work is socio-politically, emotionally, theatrically engaged in our present time and speaks to how fucked up everything is right now. So what can I possibly say? I'm not gonna say anything. You can go and read all the essays written by all the brilliant people. I'm gonna complain for five minutes. Now that was a private joke to someone who isn't here anymore. But anyway, um, yeah, it's fucking cold in here. I was sitting by the door and my butt is cold and I drank a lot of coffee and I really had to pee and then I went and there was a really long line. And uh, this piece that I chose from my institution to yours, um, you can go downstairs, you can read the wall label, you know? It'll tell you that the piece was made in 1987 for a group show at LACMA. They're in uh, Catholic Taste, it's one of my favorite books, on page 193. Howard Fox, a curator, writes about it elegantly in two and a half pages. Um, so what I'll talk about instead is space. I've always been engaged in the work of Mike Kelly because of its space. 
uh, s the space is a place. Uh, <laughs> that's not funny. So now I'll take up my notes, because I forgot everything I was going to say. Um, his work has a sense of urgency, right? When you see it, it screams at you. It tells you to pay attention, like Bruce Nowen. It tells you that it's going to be addressing you as a viewer in a really active way. Uh, you could say it's aggressive, you could say it's antagonistic, or you could say it's really, really generous, because he also tells you how he thinks. And he's one of the most lucid writers I know in terms of articulating his ideas really, really clearly in clear language. There's no art speak and rigor mole. There's no pretension. Uh, it's good. So the space of this work, of these birdhouses, I've always found really, really comical. Uh, I first saw them in the Whitney retrospective. And uh, yeah, at first I was dismissive. I was like, oh yeah, okay, DIY, and just go find a book on how to make a birdhouse. But here we have the, the dialectic, <laughs> the hard road and the easy road. And if you look, the hard road is the road more taken. Uh, there are a lot of open doors in Mike Kelly's work. There are set constructions, there are theaters, there are churches, but there really is an open door. And the open door is saying, hey, come on in. You know, you're welcome. Come climb into my dirty hole and watch a crappy movie with a bunch of horny teenagers. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in these things. Uh, <laughs> There's often, to me though, this real invitation about like, who is in the work? Is it the artist? Is it the viewer? Is it all of humanity? Is it the history of construction? Because our, Mike Kelly understood that an artwork is a construction, right? We know that when we see artworks, they're not representations, they're not real. They are heavily constructed, considered things, even if they are from your guts. Even if it is being communicated right here in the space that comes from inside, this is a very direct communicative form, art, and we have to hold on to that. And I appreciated um, Elizabeth Sussman being optimistic at the end, because I can get all dark, especially getting consumed by this work. So I'm going to try not to go there. And uh, moving right along, Monkey Island, there's a lot of space. Moving right along, back to the piece. From my institution to yours, from LACMA, from the loading dock, from Cal Arts to LACMA to PS1. Uh, it's really clean. You can't walk on this. You're not really supposed to be a part of it. These drawings were found, Mike Kelly said he collected them at the loading dock, the workers' drawings. This is workers' art. The, the workers made this art. The workers, the workers, the workers. These are the drawings of the workers collected in the museum. Um, but it's your boss and it's your dad yelling at you for keeping the light bulb on, but it's also somebody saying, want to fool around. So this direct engagement and this communication of bringing the viewer in, which I find throughout all of his pieces. Um, but then there's this thing about the institution, right? So where are we uh, in this curved dome where, I don't know, it hurt my neck having to look up at this for two hours. So, what I really like about this piece, besides its humor, and behind it, behind, besides this contradiction, uh, that the contradiction is here, that this piece is saying, come on in, let's unite, here's the power fist, we're all in this together. Are we artists or are we workers? Are we here to fight? Or are we completely screwed? Is it, in fact, impossible to pick up the battering ram and knock down the door? Because the door is fake. The United sign, the sign that says knock down this door, workers unite, it's been wounded. So someone already, somebody else already knocked down the door, right? I didn't knock down the door, you didn't knock down the door, someone knocked down the door. So here's the sign of trauma, but it's fake. This is, this is just metal that someone beat up for him. Um, this is not my picture, this is not my collage. This is something I found in line of the, I'm gonna close right now because my five minutes are up and we're in Detroit. For those of you who've never been there, I've never been there. These are the murals. This used to be called the Garden Court and now it's called the Diego Court. I have to go to my notes now. 1933, a collaboration between an anti-Semitic capitalist and an atheist Marxist. Diego Rivera was invited by Ford to paint a tribute to the workers. These, this is Detroit industry. This is the city of Detroit. This is 1993. This is the, this is the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next, next speaker is William Popal, who's a, 
who is a visual and performance artist and educator whose multidisciplinary works examine cultural conceptions surrounding ontology, gender, race, and social value. He had solo exhibitions at the Renaissance Society, Art Institute of Chicago, Carpenter Center, Santa Monica Museum of Art, and Kunst Halle Wien. His work has been widely shown and collected nationally and internationally, and he currently lives in Chicago, where he is an associate professor at University of Chicago. Thank you very much for coming. All right, let's get on with this. All right, uh, people talk about not speaking ill of the dead, but that's just what I've come to do. Um, let's see, not devastatingly so, but here or there, and I would expect that uh, Kelly's spirit would not be happy if I did not. The dead are not very understanding as a rule, and why should they be? They had a lot of issues in life, and the big beyond ain't no different. In fact, it's not very big after all. Some say the beyond is no bigger than a small diner, and for some reason just as greasy, a greasy beyond, very Kelly-like. So when I first saw Dialogue One, yonder, excerpt from Theory, Garbage, Stuffed Animals, Christ, 1991, I thought it was a great work. It was empty and full simultaneously. In the piece, Kelly ventriloquizes a dialogue between two toys, and it's played back through a boombox. Here's a bit of the text. The best way to fuck something up is to give it a body. A voice is killed when it is given a body. Whenever there's a body around, you see it's Faults. Bodies, faults, voices, death. Okie doke. So I've been reading a lot uh, about bodies and voices and the world. Let's not forget that. And recently, via two essays on two other dead people, Merce Cunningham and Samuel Beckett. The first essay is entitled The Human Situation on Stage, Merce Cunningham, Theodorno and the category of expression, expression, expression. Carrie Nolan, 2010. A long title, but the short of it is this. For both Adorno and Cunningham, an artistic act can be anti-narrative, a psychological, and yet fully expressive. There is no eternal referent that the body refers to. It's not expressing more than it is, more than it is doing. It can only transcend by losing itself. Here's a little bit more from Kelly's dialogue. The body of a famous critic came to our class today. Now we don't believe its writings anymore, no. <laughs> its writings became theater. We would never make that mistake. No, we would never do that. We would never give ourselves a physical manifestation. So our voice just keeps living and living and living and living in abstraction. Uh, let's see, what's the, the second essay is by Janet R. Malcolm. She wrote an essay called Matters of Memory and two plays by Samuel Beckett, um, Crap's Last Tape and Not I. Now Malcolm is primarily concerned with Not I. Now Not I, if you've ever seen the play, uh, there was a film made with Billy Whitelaw as the mouth. The play is entirely, the one character is a mouth and it is 10 minutes long. Uh, here is something from that play. She did not know what position she was in. Imagine what position, whether starting or sitting, but the brain, the brain, what? Sitting, kneeling, was the brain? No, what, lying? Yes. The words and mode of address differs from Kelly, but the problem regarding what to do with the body persists, what to do with the body. And the attempt to solve this problem by talking, just talking and talking. So, let's see. Malkin says this about not I. She says, the performance enacts the multiple dislocations of narrative from consciousness. 
and thus the mouth becomes an object, not a person. And the voice is its life. The great achievement of not I is a blurring of the edges of the body and the body's very absence. Okay, all right, what are we talking about here? I'm supposed to be moving these slides. Let's look at what we've got here. It's Cunningham, there's not I, Kelly. Okay, all right, where are we, where are we defining? All right, Kelly. Kelly's definition of the body is about instability via the criticism of another, so like Bob Dylan, that he or she is too much body or that body bodes not well for this one or that one or makes us ill or gets in our way, but we, we, we would never, we would never have a body, no, not us, we would never do that. We would never let a body get in between us and expression. For all Kelly's interest in the body, he's very ambivalent about how to be a body. That's why there's so much excess. Maybe, finally, the only real conversation that is possible for Kelly that he can imagine is between two stuffed animals and maybe a la Beckett. That's fine. Daniel Buren, the real pants shitter. <laughs> and there's our man again, okay. Thank you, Popa. Um, so, third and last, Joe Scanlon is an artist living in New York where writing and teaching is an integral practice of his studio practice. He had solo museum exhibitions at Van Abbe Museum, K21, Icon Gallery, Institut d'Art Contemporain de Villeurbanne. He's a prolific writer pub and publisher of his own artist books. He's currently professor of art and director of the program of visual arts at Princeton University, where he taught a course on amateurism uh, where Kelly was a big part of that course. And I was just told that this afternoon is actually the last class in this course, so we have some students here. And um, I want to thank Joe for approaching us to do this conference. Thank you. So the work, the work that I chose to talk about is possible in five minutes, but I, in some ways it's an a quite easy work to talk about because it sets up some very clear and almost uh, ripost uh, contrasts between what any of us do as artists and what the whole history of art has endeavored to do, at least in the modern era and all the practice that we have come to call the avant-garde. And then what, uh, what other examples there are, we might say, that one might play against this practice and this history that we're all part of. So this is just a shot of Mike Kelly's Pay for Your Pleasure from 1988. It's upstairs on the third floor here and has been shown in I think maybe 12 or 15 different cities since it was made 25 years ago. And in every city it's a condition of the work that the artwork of a criminal preferably a serial killer, is included as uh, part of the installation. So I think in something that perhaps Kelly didn't anticipate at the time, but turned out to be quite convenient, is that you can wander into almost any city and find a serial killer who's making art. So here are just some details of the installation upstairs. A few people that I photographed whose comments uh, I, I find particularly amusing or banal. Uh, if you don't know the piece, the structure is that 49 great artists and writers and thinkers and philosophers from all of history are assembled and presented in a somewhat populist 
banner array. It's almost like a cavalcade of great thinkers. And all of them are commenting on the, the value of evil and destruction and bad behavior and mayhem as essential parts of being uh, great achievers and great thinkers and great artists. So here we have Herman Hesse saying, I have a mad impulse to smash something, to commit outrages. Another shot, uh, just to pull a few people, that's Michel Foucault uh, in the middle saying, the madness of desire, insane murders, the most unreasonable passions, all are wisdom and reason, since they are part of the order of nature. This is uh, Piet Mondrian. I think the destructive element is too much neglected in art. Now, what do we think, or what do we maybe better, what do we think this work wants us to think when we hear Mondrian saying that the destructive element is too much neglected, and then we think of his, the apex of his practice and his own thinking. Uh, it would strike me that what might Kelly and the piece set out to do was to call bullshit on certainly the avant-garde. And we can say bullshit in a barroom sense, or we can approach it in a scholarly fashion. So this is a quote from Henry Frankfurt's book on bullshit, which was a very much talked about modest treatise that was written uh, in 1996. And he's a philosopher emeritus at Princeton. And I think what Frankfurt says about bullshit applies to pay for your pleasure and at least uh, the tree branch view that we can have of the, of the artists who are, whom uh, Mike Kelly has assembled. What the bullshitter hides about himself is that the truth value of his statements are of no interest to him. The bullshitter has no intention, uh, has has no intention is either reporting the truth or of concealing it. So I wanted to step back and look at the original manifestation of this piece. This is a shot from the corridor outside the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago uh, in 1988 where the piece was first produced and shown. I think it was interesting that it was an academic environment and uh, I think that Mike Kelly had quite a few laughs to himself at the transparency with which many uh, scholars and teachers came and just had a kind of uh, swooning moment when their favorite uh, subject or a favorite person of study had been valorized as such and maybe could only see it in that way as a kind of valorization. Another view of the shot at the Renaissance Society. And at that time, perhaps the, the maximal effect of this, I guess you could call it the catalyst of the piece, is this artwork that is supposed to be included by a serial killer or, or a criminal. And in Chicago, it was a painting by John Wayne Gacy. At that time, Gacy was still alive. He was still in prison. He had been up for parole several times. All had been denied. And if you aren't familiar with Gacy, Gacy was a mid-level functionary in the Chicago city government who liked to dress up as a clown and do children's parties on Saturdays and Sundays. And at one point, they found uh, 33 children's murdered, raped and murdered bodies in the basement of his house. And he was convicted and sent to prison. And part of his rehabilitation in prison was to become a painter. And I think in this work and in Mike Kelly's thinking, the irony of that was too much to let lie. So with, I think, great effort because uh, another, I think, unanticipated uh, idea that came out of the piece was that it was very hard to get a painting from John Wayne Gacy. 
because the waiting list to buy one was so long. And I don't know how Mike did it, but he somehow got up far enough in the queue to get this painting in time for when this show was on view in Chicago. So I think it's good to visit Frankfurt again. Thus, the bullshitter may not deceive us about things or his understanding of them, or even intend to. What the bullshitter does attempt to deceive us about is his enterprise. His only indisputable characteristic is to misrepresent what he's up to. And I, I continue to, to really love this piece and puzzle over it, and I, as time has worn on it, <clears throat> I feel compelled to call bullshit on Mike Kelly a little bit. And I think he would be happy to be called out on what is set up as a really like a, a, a preposterously false comparison that the piece makes. So here's the bracket, we could say, that that work operates in. On the left, we have the Mondrian, which is uh, a pinnacle of modern avant-garde production. And on the right, we have a painting by a serial killer. The one on the left, if we're to believe Mondrian and most accounts of the avant-garde, was supposed to have been an assault on society or on aesthetics or on sense and to have been progressive, to have moved whatever uh, the moment in, of its production, it was trying to move forward in some way. So uh, when Mondrian says that the destructive element is neglected, I think he's expressing some disappointment in how slowly the avant-garde, if ever, was able to achieve that. On the right, we also have a painting, but it's going in entirely the other direction. Uh, Gacy was painting so that he would get better, that he might develop some sensitivity or sensibility or even empathy for humankind. Not that he was going anywhere, but uh, I think what, what the piece and what Mike Kelly really focuses on then is this bracket between these two uh, rather arch possibilities for art. Of course, to be fair, that was 25 years ago. We could just as now, just as well now, make this comparison. We have the painting of the great avant-garde master on the left. We have the painting of the criminal, unprosecuted criminal, uh, amateur on the right. And we're given another bracket to deal with, or maybe a third position and that's of the amateur. The amateur starts to close the circle on the possibilities of art even more. And in fact, I would argue that this is really the comparison that the piece has become. The professional artist or the artists of the avant-garde from 1850 to 1989 has been squeezed out of the equation entirely. When I look at that piece now, I can only think of the pressure of uh, a kind of puerile celebrity that might be represented in the, the George W. Bush painting on the left of his toes. I presume they're his toes in the bathtub. And the Gacy painting on the right. Which brings me to the last and maybe the most mysterious detail of that piece, which is this collection box that's set up on every occasion and with a very, very innocuous uh, statement that all monies that are donated are to go to a victim's rights organization. It doesn't say who the victims are, it doesn't say what their rights are, and it doesn't say what the organization is. And I wonder uh, in, I, that, is, that is a question for me to, to ponder now and to wonder if, uh, if the victim in this case is perhaps the visitor now who's giving the money and no longer uh, either the subjects of the banners or the incarcerated criminals. Thanks.
Thank you, Joe. Um, the f first thing that I wondered about when you all told me about which pieces you picked was that they were actually all very close in time. I believe Rachel's, no, the Pay for Your Pleasure is 87, from my institution to yours is 88, and, and Pope L, the dialogue number one is 91. Um, in the building, there's a range of 40 years, more or less, of work. So it struck me as kind of peculiar or particular that you all chose these works. Um, do you think there was something very happening around that time in, in Kelly's work, or why you were drawn especially to those pieces? You just picked the piece that you liked the most, or well, how I did you? Is this working now? Good. I was very happy to learn that uh, I first wanted to talk about from my institution to yours, and, but Rachel did too, so it was great that we covered them both. And what interested me about those two pieces and others from that time period is that I feel like he was still looking for the constituency that he wanted to belong to. Was it the workers on the dock? Was it the great pantheon of artists? And then if you look a few years later, there's Lump and Pearl. Was it the absolutely abject, non-politicized worker? So I, I feel like in that period of his life, he's really looking for a place or a, or a demographic or a cohorts. Cohorts, I guess, would be the best word for me. Another thing that they all have in common is, um, we talked about it already a lot today, um, the role of the amateur, or the, you called it once, the hidden producer. Um, in, in Pay for Your Pleasure, it's the criminal who starts painting in prison. In, in For my institution to yours, it's the dock workers or the secretaries who have pin-up uh, works in, in their offices. And then Dialogue 1 is one of the Afghan pieces which relates to the stuffed animals but also the, the craft. Um, you just taught this class on, on amateurism. What, what was your angle on Kelly? And you also talked about it in, in your presentation. We didn't really get to Mike Kelly. We're getting to him today. This is our last class. But if I, what we did talk about a lot in the class was uh, inclusion and exclusion. How you know what you're looking at if you're an amateur. And then if you are, how one becomes a professional amateur, especially in the art world. And that would be something that I would definitely talk about with Mike's work was the fact that he did, in a way, become a professional amateur. Would, would you agree, Rachel? I, I mean, in, in your talk, I was very um, interested about this idea of, I think you called it generosity, like all these motifs of open doors, openings, and, and how... It puts the, the audience or the, the viewer in a very um, particular position. Pope Al's piece has two chairs for the audience or the um, educational complex has this mattress where people should lie under. Um, is that something that very interests you? I, I wasn't paying attention. But if you're talking about things being simultaneously inviting and repulsive mm -hmm. and simultaneously, like that's what I meant, like, come on in, watch yeah. the movie, it's unbearable. Or, and then you're being you know, pushed out again. Go into the organ shack. I mean, it, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the, this kind of push and pull, but then also the question, and I didn't say it, but uh, that image I found online of the tourists looking at the Diego Rivera murals, and are, is it awe? I mean, they're looking up. 
So do we project onto their, I, I looked at that picture and I was like, oh, this is great, they're overwhelmed, they're encompassed, you know, and uh, the, uh, Rivera didn't want to make paintings that were portable objects and ended up at Sotheby's. He wanted the work to be physically, this fresco cycle, part of the public space. And we all know now the hypocrisy that's built into this with museum admissions, right? So, and I'm not talking about Detroit, I'm talking about New York City. And so then it's like, oh, okay, am I project, are these tourists really going wow? Or are they going, ugh? You know, I don't want to look at a bunch of people on the assembly line. That's what I do all day. That's really depressing. Or it's what I used to do all day. <laughs> no, if you live in Detroit, it's that's, that's what, yeah. what I used to do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well maybe that makes it even worse. And more depressing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Popal, you brought up a whole other perspective on. Um, I'm like I've now the show's been up for two months and um, I've worked quite a few people through the show and it's quite remarkable how everyone reads it very personal and tries to, f I mean, I'm sure it also has to do with um, Kelly's recent death, but really tries to read uh, personal clues into the work. And I'm very, in a way, grateful that you brought up um, Beckett and Cunningham and um, the idea of actually really disimpersonalize um, the work or there's the mouth without the body or Cunningham is trying to find this dance that has expression but it has nothing to do with the expression of an, something interior. Um, do you, can you talk about like seeing that work first? Where did you see it first? And Yeah, when I first saw um, the dialogue piece, it, the boombox wasn't playing. And I think uh, that was very uh, generative for me because his voice didn't get in the way. I mean, nothing against Kelly, but um, it was interesting to see it. Uh, it was only years later that I even learned there was a text. And it was interesting to be able to have a life with the piece when there was no, there was language already, I thought. You know, he'd set it up so well that you could imagine whatever you liked. Um, of course, tinted with his shadings of the kinds of um, toys he used, or the blanket, or even the type of boombox. So I thought that was, that was very smart in and of itself. And I think that's the emptiness that I found in it. But then later when I read the text, um, I thought that's very smart too. But then when I heard his voice, I thought, well, maybe that's too much. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's out of respect that I bring in these other people because um, You know, I think he's the kind of person who, it's like working with performers, you know, you ask a performer to do something on stage and um, you know it's going to be risky. And uh, it takes a lot of balls to do that in a way, you know, or you just don't give a shit or you do, right? And so I think that he's the kind of person who uh, takes, how do you say, he's very driven by the personal. So that's part of the struggle is how do you, How do you cathect that stuff without it being the stuff? And I think that's, uh, that, that's a very it's an interesting problem, that he chose to be personal, but then found a way to um, have it be something he could share. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a tough problem. Just to expand on that, because I agree that it's a really interesting problem about how can it be about himself and because it was so narcissistic it's my childhood it's my house from the, like my father beat me you know it's like who cares you know we all have our own problems but it really this is where i go back to the kind of uh, and maybe it goes back to community theater that we were thinking of earlier but this kind of participation and that the engagement is from the viewer to project into the work back onto the self uh, which is why your examples were interesting too because um they're such high art <laughs> which works for me. You know? <laughs> Or not. <laughs> But you would say that's also in what you call the space, like you get drawn in and pushed out. Yeah, and I, I mean, I respect uh, every audience person, like anyone who could just stumble into a museum because they're there on a school trip and they'd never been in a museum before or they, you know, got lost on their way to the bathroom or they like me, never go to Broadway musicals and had never heard Pippin before, you know? I mean, there's, we're all drawn to things. 
And just you know about high art examples, it's funny that the text, uh, I didn't have time to go through the one about Cunningham, but that was when he was starting out, and he didn't know how to sequence anything. It's really funny, and he used to tell the dancers, you work out the phrases, and, and I'll sequence it. And so, <laughs> so that's, what, that's why I was interested in it. I didn't have time to get into it, but he was trying to figure out, how do I make a dance? And, and that's why I was sort of interested in that. And with Beckett, he was dying, so... Maybe at both ends of it, we think harder. I don't know. Death's coming. The train is coming at you, or it's leaving the station. I don't know. But um. Joe, I was. I'm not sure I really understood your presentation, the part of the bullshitter. But you basically called Kelly out to bullshit and pay for your pleasure. Well, I think he became one of those artists in the corridor that he, in, in the early on, was calling out. But I think it's something that he, we do when we're young and brash and want to take a piece out of the thing that we want. Certainly Mike, is, uh, as much as anyone, was about killing the father. And I, he became the father. And, I don't know if he ever really liked that position or uh, I think he struggled with it. And I guess I've come to think that that piece isn't about evil or destruction at all. It's about a kind of inevitable popularity or almost maybe he could see a no-win situation even from then of like, well, I can continue to just make the most, these miserable, painful, awkward performances and objects and be, and have them be that, or I can become Mike Kelly. And I don't think he, I, I think both options are really fraught. And so I guess maybe it's a little harsh to call bullshit on him, but to, wonder out loud may, just what is is there no choice are the or why were those the only two choices before we open up to the audience i i was wondering or wanted to ask all of you a little bit if you had a personal relationship or at least if you didn't have with him definitely with the work joe you might be, have the most direct in the way that you actually did a piece that very um, explicitly relates to pay for your own pleasure. You restaged or redid the work um, for a museum show in Europe. Could you talk a little bit about that and how it maybe relates to your relationship to Kelly or his work? I guess I would say maybe I, I I made a reprise of that piece. It's called Pay for Your Pleasure Reprise. And it was me trying to answer the question of what happened to that piece. Can I still look at it now? And is this tension between the avant-garde and truly aberrant behavior, does it still exist? Or is there a new tension? Is that tension, did that tension die with the Berlin Wall and with postmodernism? And if so, is there a new tension? For me, the new tension was popularity. So the piece was kind of the flip side of, if his was about destruction and evil, mine was about uh, doing the most good for the most people and that being the best idea of art. You, maybe just to explain for those who don't know the piece, you took different people and they all had quotes more on um, democracy and humanity. Correct? Yeah, there, were, there was one person who's the same in both, uh, Plutarch. And then I chose my all-star team. But and you think you're going to end up there too one day? <laughs> well, I think now the question would be which one would I end up in because uh, I don't know. Rachel, you um, told me that you're highly influenced by Mike's work. Um, I said I really like it. I yeah. didn't know him, and I really like the work. 
So when, when did you first come across it? I don't remember. I could make something up. Yeah. I used to play with stuffed animals. I used to put them on the floor in arrangements and photograph them. <laughs> and Popel, you, do you, when did you come across the work first? Or how did you? See, when, I, when I was coming out of theater, people used to mention, um, and I was like making certain things public that I had been doing for a while, people said, well, they would say two names to me, Mike Kelly and Robert Ryman. <coughs> And I chose Robert Ryman, so it tells you something about me. Can I comment on something that Joe said yes, and then go to the audience and see what the audience thinks? Um, and just to clarify, uh, we had an email, we all had to choose one piece, and I said to Jenny, oh, I really want to talk about Mobile Homestead. And she said Elizabeth Sussman was talking about homos, uh, Homestead. And then she said that Joe is going to talk about pay for your pleasure or from my institution to yours. Why don't we get Joe to talk for pay for your pleasure and you could talk to my institution? I thought, oh, that's great because I didn't know the piece and it's the first thing you see when you walk to the museum and I really liked it. So I just wanted to clarify that point. And about mobile Homestead, because I think what Joe talks about, which is difficult, which happens to all artists. I mean, let's not talk about the Rolling Stones, the fact they still perform. Um, you know, we all get older and suck, that's inevitable. So this is the failure in his work that I think is, I see at the beginning. And art, I mean, Joe, you know this, stuff looked different in the 90s, right? So stuff looked different in the 80s and it looked different in the 90s and the idea of radicality and the idea of production value and things that might be a turn off by canders and blah, 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 I think is almost repaired. And I was thinking it by Mobile Homestead. And I was thinking about the way that Elizabeth outlined this thing, and, and I wrote down that she said that Mike said it was performed in bad faith. Um, and I think the, the, the failure of taking your mobile home through the town, and I, there was a lot of discussion about this video about the people of Detroit, and I'm, I, I was glad to learn today that he had someone else make that video and was back in LA remotely editing it. Because when I watched it, someone gave me a copy and I was like looking at it at home and I was like, Ugh, this is like watching like HBO documentaries. I don't want to watch this. You know, like it was so generic. And then there's the black tranny heroin addicts on the stoops talking about their addiction, but they kind of look really well styled. So then I thought maybe the whole thing was cast, and then it got more interesting. So like in terms of what is truth and where is, what was his intention with that work? Uh, he also said this thing that public artworks are always passive aggressive. Now I like that as well. Because I'm, I don't know, who, who is art for? This, to go back to this thing of like, who is the audience? Who is his audience? Who is the audience in the 80s or the 90s versus 2012 in a gallery context? Or Detroit that's bankrupt? So uh, I don't know if anything I said just made sense, but I wanted to put that out there. And the sub-level, like the, the, the mobile home is going to a space and we don't really know what goes on there. So that's very open. And it could be, it could be part of the repair do we have questions from the audience? I think, take mine here. Yeah. Some, something that I had noticed when I was looking at Pay For Your Pleasure, um, when I first came to see this, this, uh, this exhibition, is that in spite of the fact that the wall text and later um, other people who've talked about it um, talk a lot about the John Wayne Gacy painting, um, the painting that's now filling that space is anonymous. And that's something that I can't exactly put my finger on why that seems important to me. But it seems almost as if it sidesteps something of the impact that the piece could have within the context of an exhibition. Um, I mean, like you'd spoken about the kind of an anonymity of the donation bin. Um, and uh, I don't know, or maybe it's not that it sidesteps it so much as that it mirrors the two anonymities so effectively that it kind of like allows the more seamless reading that you gave us. Um, would you, I guess, would you like care to like either, I would love to hear from you like who actually was the painter um, or just hear from the rest of you like if you think that there is any kind of an impact that that gives this piece. Um, I didn't put the show together, but I was told it's from um, 
a criminal called Arthur Scarcrow, I believe. Chris, are you here? Shawcross. Shawcross. And um, he doesn't live anymore, but he was in prison for murdering. And if I understand correctly, that every iteration of the piece being installed needs a different um, painting by an amateur criminal painter. Maybe, Joe, you want to? I don't know, actually, if... I assume every time it's shown, the, that painting has to be purchased. But then whether they all become a cache of paintings back at LA MoCA, which owns the piece, I don't know. Um, that would be a, a question for, for MoCA. It seems to, if that's the case, then it's the piece itself is kind of collecting that type of production over, over the years. About the anonymity, I mean, I agree with what Rachel was saying. I think I just have to come to, I love that piece so much that I maybe I just have to come to terms with that the time has closed on it. And I'm looking at, a, I'm looking at it in a bell jar now. It doesn't have any active uh, effect. It doesn't catalyze anything. It's a, a mausoleum piece. Which is also, I loved your, uh, to actually have a Mondrian <laughs> and just say, this is a destructive act, <laughs> you know? I mean, to, to tell a young artist that is always impossible, right? To explain that avant-garde gesture now when we, you know, does that extend your thought a little bit? Like how we experience Mondrian now? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So it's become a classic. Is that what you say? Yeah. Well, I, it's so it's so perfect that he loved MC5 because it's hard to think of a band that almost made it in such beautiful fashion as they did. I mean, they were legendary, but they were never, uh, I guess we would use the word sellouts, either because their music was just always a little too aggressive and unmarketable for the AOR people, or because they insisted on that. So I. I I think he admired that, but maybe that's not what happened to him, or what he had happen, what he made happen for himself. There's another question. This is uh, less a question than a comment. It seemed to me that, Rachel, you, you set up the dynamic of Kelly in terms of intense repulsion, intense attraction. And Joe, you see the dynamic as one of identification. He sought to identify the worker, the lumpen proletariat, that he was Oedipal in his you know, identification or idealization of the father. I think that's completely wrong. I think Kelly really wanted to show us the dangers of identification and idealization. You know, personal, institutional, right on through. And that, that for me is the key. So in, in a way, there is a question. Why do you think that? And why do I think the other thing? Well, I could point to numerous instances even today where I have a word has popped into my head that I would never have thought, which is the word genuine and that I think Mike liked genuine things, whether they're tranny crack addicts telling their story on a stoop or uh, just somebody who isn't so self-conscious that they're not just laying it all out. I think he really liked that kind of daring in people. And so I think for a long time, perhaps he performed a kind of detachment or disinterest in the genuine or the authentic, because one had to, uh, if you, unless you just wanted to be laughed out of the art world uh, for the last 25 years. So maybe someone mentioned earlier uh, the word fulcrum, and I, maybe the genuine is a kind of fulcrum in his work between the mockery and the, not mockery, but the tough eye on all these kinds of production, but then the loving eye for all the same kinds of production. So...
I think he was, I think he was, I think the work struggled with the performance of itself and, and given the context that it was made in. That's what I would say. He wasn't H.C. Westerman. I, I agree with that. I agree with this last word that Joe used, struggle. I was thinking of this in, also in terms of the genuine. And I was thinking how that it's an art historian that wants to define and to say what is and isn't true. And it's an artist that accepts the contradiction and the difficulty through process in which creation happens. Because in the creative act, things are confused. And it's very, very difficult to know what they are until you see them and then you see how they're performed. So if you've put a lot of stuffed animals on blankets and photographed them as a child as I did and put them in my high school Euro book, and then someone calls me a pedophile, and I go, but I'm only 16. That's not illegal. You know, that is legal or isn't legal. I don't know. What I'm saying is that as an artist, Mike was talking about danger. And he was also about talking about this kind of danger of saying what meaning is and how meaning operates to a viewer. And that's why I'm saying the door is opened and you can come in if you dare and have a very pleasant experience and watch Day is Done and giggle or be really, really disturbed by the boy in the barber's chair. You know, I mean, both things are going on. And I think it's the sophistication of his work and his intelligence that he was able to operate these things while questioning himself. I mean, it wasn't easy <laughs> to make this work. And we all suffer because of his challenges to do this, you know? So the struggle is there and that's maybe... Uh, and that's also where humor comes in, right? Tragic comic. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask... I, I, um, I was just going to say, I, I think that's why we did focus on, or we accidentally focused on this area of his life or his production and that we're attracted to the struggle. Maybe, maybe the, to different degrees, the three of us remember what that struggle was used to look like and would like to get some of it back. Used to. Well, You're the, over the hump, Joe? That's, that might be the Princeton's question. treating you well? I'll leave it there. Pope Al, do you want to say something about humor? <laughs> <laughs> or the struggle? I'll just say one thing about just public artworks, and I guess you're right, Rachel, they are, you know, why, you know, why are public artworks, you know, I, I've done a number of them, you know, why are they uh, a mixture of kind of a, this tension in them, and I mean, in fact, that's why I'm interested in them, but I think whenever you work with anyone, you know, whether it be a family structure or a business structure, there's going to be how do you say, there's going to be uh, this thing at stake about what we want, I think the thing that Americans have the hardest thing doing is getting together to decide what they want. But when you do a public artwork, that's exactly what you have to do. And um, if your job, as I think my job as an artist, has been to not lower the standard of what we want, people get pissed off, you know, and you're going to have issues. Uh, but if my job also as the artist is to make the work, then you have to come to some kind of, you know, hateful word, compromise with what you're going to do, you know, and, um, but I find that that's an interesting value, that struggle, you know, to work with people you don't know, you know, uh, maybe for five minutes um, to do a project that maybe is two years long or whatnot, and that, and, and to give your life to something like that, um, uh, in my, you know, in my case, in some cases, uh, and believe for two years that you can do this thing, and to watch it evolve from something that you think you own, <laughs> is my idea, to something that in some ways, even though your name may be on it, is very alien to you. But because I believe in the community that I do it with, you know, I say, okay, sure, that's me. But I think it's an interesting struggle, so yes, of course. But I think this country is perfect for a, a passive aggressive public art. This is what we do. Maybe we do it best, I don't know. But how would you compare, say, what you've just described, which uh, I'm assuming it's something you're working on right now? No, I've been doing it for 20 years. I know, but... Uh, I mean, the pr that process. Right, but I guess what, as you were speaking, I was thinking of things that, where you have to cooperate with other people 
but then things that you could just decide to do, like some of your other public works. Would you, do you see a, a, a contrast or a difference between the two? Or even if you're crawling up the street and someone has to, let's say someone doesn't want to get out of your way, that's also that negotiation? Well, I'm not trying to be a formalist, but why not? Now, I think that uh, solo crawls are models for mass crawls, which I've done for 15 years, 20 years. And mass crawls are models for solo crawls. I learn from both, how would you call it, uh, formats, how each can make the other one better. So after I started doing mass crawls, I couldn't do the solo crawls the same way, not with the same head. And when I did mass crawls, you know, I do require that the communities I work with, you know, I, I really push them to try to do it as if it's a solo, to have that kind of commitment. So they're all solo, or that, that they're kind of in that character of being solo in the it's mass? It's a family. It's a family. <laughs> Why don't I Cousins believe you when you say that? Cousins and aunts and uncles of crawling. Do, do we have another... <laughs> question in the audience? I was just going to ask Popel if he could say a little bit more about this idea of um, expressive or expression that you alluded to and also just for everybody this how you think his work um, like because it has set what feels like such a personal element how it um, how it doesn't digress and in some way, and what I think today we think of a lot of really personal work is can be digress. digress. That's a great question, but I have no idea what you said. <laughs> no, I liked it. I, I, I don't know how to answer it. Do you want to tell me more or? About the, the <laughs> personal and the digression, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like we, there's a, you know, a lot of dialogue around what it is to be expressive, and there's a lot, of, um, a lot of writing about that in relationship to art, and I think there's a lot of work that gets made that gets, you know, criticized, and often rightly so, for being sort of devolving into the personal in this way that, you know, there's just this line between delving into the personal that can feel really narcissistic or masturbatory and then there's the one that somehow Mike Kelly does that somehow doesn't do that and I don't know if you have thoughts on, on that. Well, yeah, I think like I, I, I said, I think there are some Kelly works that probably slip more into not working maybe because he is and then there are some that he's found a way or a language to be able to share it with us through other modes. And I, I, th but I think that's the problem, you know, of all artists that you have is that, you know, you, I think sometimes uh, it's sitting in front of you, you're working with students and you're teaching and they want to do something on their families. I say no, because it's very hard for them to separate from those people, you know, so, or if I say yes, I have to be willing to go on that journey with them where they're gonna, they, I'm gonna ask them to go further and they're not gonna wanna go. Uncle Joe is not a pedophile. I think he may be one, <laughs> but I can't go there, all right? So, and to ask a student to take that leap, you know, to ask him to take that risk um, is quite, uh, how do you say, is that quite a request? So, you know, personal expression, I think for artists, uh, when you learn more about what expression is, you realize you don't own it, you know? Um, the, the more I express, and maybe it sounds like Beckett, the more I realize that I have no fucking idea what I'm saying. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the more you do it, the more you realize that it's so much beyond your capacity to get it. Um, I had a quick question about the relationship between Mike Kelly's work and psychology. I'm a, coming from it as a psychologist, but I know he referred to projections and uh, he quotes Wilhelm Reich and Harry uh, Harlow, which are big psychologists. So just maybe any relationship you see, or am I just trying to project it into it? Excuse me? <laughs> what was that ghost voice? You have a great voice. You're like a creature out there. Where are you? What, what did he say? Psychology. Yeah, psych 
But you're asking the panel, a what? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Someone, I. I, I applaud your instinct. I, I, we all think his work is really psychological. Um, can you re -ask, rephrase the question? Or just tell us what you think? Okay, well, um, my university just published a paper about how art can increase human empathy. And I, I'm not a fan of art doing anything other than being art, but um, I am a psychologist and it does have the capacity to heal trauma if, if, if you want to go down that route. But I'm just wondering if if as an artist he was engaging in any psychology practices or is that again trying to project something into it was it just a, the struggle I I only know that Mike Kelly Mike Kelly's skepticism shall we say for something like repressed memory syndrome was is on the public record but was also a really fertile idea for him to mine. But he, he, subst he didn't treat it, this maybe speaks a little bit to the previous question, it wasn't about his mother and father. He subbed in Hans Hoffman or someone to have the repressed memory of abuse from. So I, th I think the way he the way that I, one of the things that I really like about Mike's work is this instinct that he had to have the sock puppet do the heavy lifting, have the, the stand-in or the surrogate take some of the uh, personalness out of the idea but to keep all the weight and, and discomfort and psychological effect in it just by putting it over there and having that thing enact it, not him and not his details, not his personal details. So I feel like I have a lot of access to those ideas in his work because I don't, I'm not looking at an autobiography. I'm looking at a condition that many people experience or share, but it doesn't have a name or a face on it. I think um, we're actually up with our time. Um, thank you very much. And next is going to be John Welchman. Hello, everyone. So for our final and valedictory address, we're very happy to have John C. Welchman in the VW Dome today. His Bio, his extensive bio, is in the program. I would uh, recommend that you see his background. The reason that we were interested in having John come and speak is that a great deal of his scholarship in, to Mike Kelly's practice has been in the outer reaches and ephemera of Mike's work. So his, his writing as a critic, his artist books, his music production, uh, and uh, all of the things that are not so object-based, uh, uh, John has published several books and collections of Mike's work in that regard, and he's also currently the chair of the Mike Kelly Foundation. So uh, join me in welcoming John C. Welchman. Well, thanks, Joe and Jenny, and to everyone at... Uh, Oh, can you keep that on? That'd be great. Everyone at PS1 for organizing today's event, and thank you all for coming out on a nice, cold New York day, uh, which is challenging for us all. Yep, good. I got some lights here. Artist, noise musician, writer, actor, benefactor, teacher, and Catholic misfit. Mike Kelly was a wholehearted and cantankerous sage with an indelible blue-collar background who was sometimes so wired in to the elemental stakes of the American vernacular that during certain on-song weeks, he generated enough ideas and imaginings to last another sort of artist an entire career. While his day job transformed him inexorably, sometimes painfully, 
into a high-end artist, even into a minor celebrity. He never relinquished his preferred role as a counterculture warrior, fighting for the release of the voices and skills. Ooh, sorry about this. Look at that. The voices and the skills that he always felt mainstream institutions kept in positions of muteness or invisibility. He tried to understand his culture from the bottom up, scouring thrift stores and yard sales for its refuse and cast-offs, addressing with an inimitable mix of caustic skepticism and what I can only describe as temporizing honor, the languages and assumptions of education, of adolescence, of crafts and DIY, of holidays, of pop psychology, of parades and rituals, of fandom, of newspaper reportage, public address, and innumerable other conditions of daily life. When I attempted a survey of Mike's work back in 1999, I titled it The Mike Kellys, a playful and somewhat hopeless reminder of the staggering plurality of positions and personae that made up his artistic identity. What was already true at the end of the 90s was further underlined in the ensuing decade, during which Mike's work broke out in a breathtaking sequence of new syntheses between means and materials that had often coexisted, video, sculpture, performance, music, photography, but were now cross-hatched in a careening agenda of issues and formats that engendered the epic cyclicality and cabaret Americana of Day is Done. The collision of sci-fi projection, personal fantasy, and vitreous color represented by the Candor's works, and amid all this, a return to painting and drawing with a caricatural bent, mostly made in a small private studio adjacent to his former residence. I want to make some comments this afternoon about the range uh, um, of Mike's career, about the different practices that span almost its entirety. And I want to touch on some, at least, of the daunting spectrum of genres, material subjects, and illusions with which he worked. The question to which I want to respond is focused through Mike's negotiation with different articulations and perceptions of the future, how it arises inexorably and capriciously from the past, particularly that sense of history, whether personal or social, that is mediated by capacities and fantasies of memory, how it takes up with formalized discourses of the future, such as utopianism, which with, with which Mike engaged in different forms for some three decades, and how the call of the future, whether calibrated in religious, political, or aesthetic dimensions, simultaneously liberates and blinds. And I want to do this in three sections. The first section is called writing. Now, while it is almost impossible to generalize about the hectically different styles, genres, tones, and impersonations embedded in his writing, I want to suggest that they, take, they took up with the provocative notion of what Mike himself termed socialized visual communication. And, that a key aspect of what is meant by this prescient phrase correlates with Kelly's sense of where things come from and where and how they might end up. Kelly's writing is marked in general by his attempt to draw the work to which it refers, its forms, its audiences, its conceptual and historical references, and the further texts that it occasions, designates, or appropriates into a multi-layered compositional totality based on an open logic of association, consumption, and repressive return. While essential to understanding his visual production, the, write the writings that Mike produced about a certain project are never exactly the key to it, even when the fluency and conviction of his statements are almost overwhelming, and even if the artist himself sometimes suggested that he was supplying the proper deficit of a proper understanding that was never quite negotiated by outside critics. 
Instead, the writings illuminate and italicize, exaggerate and drift, rubbing up against the work to which they refer like voices that haunt the world of its possibilities. In some instances, the writing, of course, merges with the project itself and can't be pulled out of or pushed through it. This is the case with the satirical poster text of a stopgap measure here from 99, Mike's millennial essay in social satire in the guise of a Swiftian modest proposal with allegorical accoutrements, quite literally to perform a 69 on the fantasy figures of celebrity culture, harvesting their vanity and allure to feed and thus dissipate the repressions of a sex-starved general citizenry. An ameliated future for the health of the nation can only be achieved by the release of the social repression occasioned by a sanctioned indulgence in tabloid sexual fantasy. Something similar may be said about the word imperfect analyses of we communicate only through our shared dismissal of the pre-linguistic from 95, which takes the form of a series of 15 approximately page-long texts presented in two modes. On the gallery walls, next to color photographs of paintings made under Kelly's tutelage by kindergarten students while he was an undergraduate art student at the University of Michigan in the 1970s, and from the hard drive of a nearby computer terminal accessible interactively to exhibition visitors. Each text offered a detailed interpretation of the image with which it was paired, summoning up colorful renditions of the, quote, insights and technical language of child art analysis and art therapy. As with most of Kelly's projective writings, these pieces have the uncanny effect of layering the rhetoric of zealously professionalized diction with hermeneutic overdetermination so that the reader is constantly shuttled between plausibility and denial. Contradiction, reading in, and the blurring of subject positions between analyst, parent, child, and reader, viewer, accelerated by the interactive component of the display, are brought together here in a consummate effort of ironic commentary. We Communicate addresses the very predicates of the future, now marked as a place that might be off limits to young subjects, as, they as what they produce is read by an overzealous science like entrails. It takes on the conditions of the involuntary, which in this case arise from two sets of cultural givens. On the one hand, the series of purportedly expressive children's drawings, paintings, which it is supposed arise spontaneously and characterologically from the young subjects who make them. On the other, the analytic paradigms of child psychology itself, which transform the paintings into supposedly unpremeditated testimony. The flatness and neutrality of the photograph is the catalyst through which both the materials of the paintings and the theoretical apparatus that occasions their interpretation are forced to pass. As in the wider culture, photography becomes a leveling device that generates a fine-grained evenness or social flatness. It is an emblem of a present whose destiny is only and inexorably to realize and inscribe the trauma of the past. The ubiquity of photographic imagery is thus a kind of camouflage that disguises and then collides the apparently antithetical postulates which fire up the piece. First, it serves to massage the textural and other physical traits of the pictorial origins so that their surfaces can be trawled for symbolic depth. And secondly, it conjures a disparate sequence of children's paintings into an archival assemblage which can be subjected to generalized analysis. All of this converges satirically and disruptively on the very nature of the purportedly involuntary actions on which the whole project is predicated. The assumption by child psychology that such images grant access to the phobias and fantasies of the subjects who paint them and that these 
disturbances once identified can be modified, dissipated, or even cured. By questioning the etiquettes of the decoding process that attempt to secure this assumption, Kelly is challenging some of the fundamental points of connection between will and reflex, the activities said or assumed to transpire in and at the intersection of conscious and unconscious states. He's also undermining the false futurism of the psychological method, outflanking its bid to engender betterment through prescriptive diagnosis and the production of properly standardized subjects. Now, in other circumstances of writing and reflection, Mike gives us something, whether a position or a personification, that we could never imagine the work might possess, and goes on to make its apposition virtually inevitable. This is the plot or the ruse behind Mike's writings, egging us on to weave our own critical fantasies through the network of salient orientations he conducively lays down. The work is addressed to a future conditional that eventuates in the reading process itself. It's not a question of what will transpire, the hard-wired future, but of what might take place according to any number of projections, reconstructions, personifications, and conjectures. Some aesthetic high points from 1991 seen here was written, Kelly noted, in lieu of a biographical statement for inclusion in a monograph. Setting protocol on a collision course with ritual and autobiographical probity, it purposefully contaminates the conventional formats of self-presentation, the annotated curriculum vitae or personal statement. This oddball sequence of captioned images conjugates several of Kelly's wider strategies. First, partly by accident, but in some measure, of course, by design, the ragtag cluster of unlikely, quote, high points shuttles back and forth between the factual and the facetious. But it does so in large part as a consequence of assumptions projected on it by its readers or viewers. As Kelly observed, the piece probably constituted, quote, my most misunderstood text. It has often been cited as a serious commentary on my aesthetic concerns. In fact, it was designed as a humorous jab at the impossibly difficult assignment to write a thumbnail encapsulation of my artistic practice. A significant segment of Kelly's outreach operates thus in the fitfully faulty space between presentation and expectation, which, as with the false personal emotions projected onto his stuffed animals and toy pieces, the artist reincorporates in subsequent related work. In Day is Done, for example, Kelly mobilizes a technique of appropriation using found, mostly black and white photographs sourced from newspapers and magazines from the 40s through the 90s that had become subject to a whole roster of subjective and paranoid projections. The gap exploited by Kelly between the common snapshot or documentary conditions of these images and the tumultuous forms of projection and situational reconstruction he visited on them acts as a reservoir supplied with prodigious new amounts of ironic energy. Now, while focused on the idea of condensation, the styles and textures of Keller's writings are typically profuse. One response to the wide net of research he felt obliged to cast was the compilation of, quote, a lot of notes, very fast. You know, ba-boom, ba-boom, bum, bum, bum. Many of his texts start out then with strings of concepts and quotations assembled with speed and rhythmic compression. Often departing from these concentrated clusters, the spectrum of Kelly's styles ranges from an expository mode, trying, quote, to explain to people what I'm up to in a very clear way, 
mostly reserved for catalog essays and commissions, through the explicit corruption of this clarity using parodic forms of, quote, pseudo-exposition and high flights of fantasy, right through to the penning of what he called wild manifestos, like going home, going home. Each mark on this gradient of types is ranged against a particular aspect of standardization. Exposition is set against standard interpretation, critical consensus, received opinion. Pseudo-exposition utilizes but then derails the standard formats established for critical and artistic writing, while the more excessive moments of Kelly's own textual production merge document and fiction, common sense and reverie in fusillades of ironic moralism or parodic social zeal. Kelly saw the very notion of what was standard as a kind of revenge of the future over the present and a standard bearer for their mutual defeat of the past. The standard offered then a measure of evenness and anodyne ineffability that signaled the triumph of the safe and predictable over the travails of becoming. Section two is called tenses. Bearing in mind the punning adjudications between the past and the future, such as this one from the performance, we've already seen this image today, MySpace from 1978, to which Kelly was so often given, I want to start with two moments when he took up with the thoughts and propositions of other artists about temporality in the hope that I can briefly show how he made them over as his own. In a work we've talked a lot about today as well, Pay for Your Pleasure, Kelly cites a poem by Francis Picabia. Here it is. I love the unfrocked priest, the freed convict. They are without past and without future, and so live in the present. Picabia signposts here two eventualities in which subjects who are probably possessed by their avocation, a life of crime or religious service, are presented with the opportunity to change by being ejected or released from the institutions that bound and administered them, prison and the church. Picabia tells us, with whatever measure of irony, that he loves the persons and their situations thus presented at the threshold of their new eventualities, presumably because of the existential liberation they face through the possible obliteration of their pasts and the lack of a specific orientation toward another future. Of course, Picabia's verse is veined with Dada provocation on the one hand, and it is pressed into service by Kelly for the specific needs of the investigation of art, criminality, and bad behavior represented by Pay for Your Pleasure. But it does, I think, point to an allocation between the frameworks of past, future, and present to which Kelly could, in fact, never accede. It is not so much that the proposition that criminals, abusive priests, and possibly those responsible for art live in the present. It's not that this is unworkable here, for there is evidence in Kelly's thinking that the tumult of personal and social history and a future meted out in quasi-fictive projections conspire to accentuate a traumatic present. From a Kellyan point of view, rather, it is the very allocation of these temporalities so that one is putatively separate from the others that puts Picabia's formula into crisis. For the guilt, sin, familial trauma, and educational abuse of the past can never be suppressed or erased, even by the special forces of rehabilitation, radical change, or art itself. This is one of the several raw notes from Kelly's last major project, Mobile Homestead. A second example, 
Kelly curated a signal work by Edward Keenholz into the checklist for his exhibition, The Uncanny, first staged in 93 and redone a decade later. The piece was called The Future as an Afterthought, 1962, and takes the form of a wooden pedestal flanked by what appeared to be pedals from a child's toy and surmounted by a tightly clustered congregation of unclothed, strapped-in dolls. Now, it cannot be argued in any simple sense that the tagline of ironic deferral and implied trivialization arbitrated by Keenholz's title can stand in for G uh, Kelly's general attitude to the project of the future. The more so, perhaps, as Keenholz's tableau formatted social allegories general off generally offered more um, literalized and directed forms of narrative or quasi-narrative commentary than Kelly's more opaque configurations despite the fact that this particular piece has a concentration and singularity that's quite different from Keenholz's more expansive stage set-like scenographies. So while Keenholz straps a whole population of figurative dolls into confinement, creating a readily suggestive emblem of incarceration or the loss of freedom, Kelly typically addresses the existential abstractions of the diminishment of liberty as in the Samuel Beckett-like exchanges of his dialogue series. For example, this is a great coincidence with Popel's uh, remarks uh, earlier, not choreographed in the least. At the same time, both artists physicalize the reach of such questions by using everyday items arbitrated by tops and bottoms on which groups of surrogates are displayed, captured and corralled by Keenholz, arranged and, arranged and specimenized by Kelly, notably in craft morphology flowchart, which you see on the right here. But there is also a resonance from Keenholz's titular phrase that carries over to Kelly's own temporizing sense of the future in which that which lies beyond the now is sometimes viewed as dangerous or impossible, sometimes fatally flawed, and often unconsolably unknowable, or even irksomely unhappy. It's not surprising, then, that in the face of what one of the vampires in Day is Done describes as, quote, one of the many exploring fingers we are thrusting ever deeper and deeper into the mysterious realm and the utterly new and fascinating world that ensues. Here, secrets, quote, of both past and future are held. This is just one of Kelly's many elisions between a probably painful past and an almost certainly ill-starred future. He accentuates the mysteries and secrecies of an unknowable destiny and compounds them equally and oppositely with the obscurities of the past. Carried to extremes, as it sometimes was in Kelly's work, this is a view into the future in which nothing can really be seen, fueled by experiences from a past which are themselves barely comprehended. Kelly, of course, seldom belabored or even mourned for the losses engendered by this incomprehensibility. Instead, he provides us with evidentiary companions for the questless journey to the future, some fictitious, others appropriated. Consider, for example, the facetious events postings at the utopian arts complex, among which is word left by the quote, friends of the future custodians of America club, about the theme quote, of this term's future employment opportunities get together, self-described by the group as the impossible dream, hatched from an unlikely fraction of erstwhile optimistic economic orders, Kelly's version of the American dream is quietly recoded as a frank impossibility, as its dream work is deposited in the savings account of conjecture and fantasy. Time and again, Kelly looked to the future 
from the point of view of the past in order to conjure its ruination or celebrate the ironic ephemerality of its, quote, glory. Of the image-defacing children who soiled various iconic representations redolent of American freedom and liberty in reconstructed history here from 1989, Kelly concluded that they had taken their, quote, first toddling step toward the construction of a glorious future by this, their reconstruction of the past. Elsewhere, he examined the then current post-industrial romanticism in his 1989 essay on urban Gothic and the text on survival research laboratories, pointing to its popular cultural manifestations in cyberpunk science fiction literature, in films such as Ridley Scott's Blade Runner or Alien, in David Lynch's Eraserhead, set in surreal, crumbling industrial wastelands, or in industrial music, which he described as a, quote, romanticized and thus no longer concrete form of concrete music, tone, poems, painting the industrial landscape. This is survival research laboratories. He goes on, and I won't uh, discuss this in detail here, to develop uh, an opposition between survival research laboratories work in the presence of science fiction projection and Smithson's work, in a sense, on the timeless aspect of this. Kelly thus temporizes and on occasions inverts are models of utopian speculation. Most of these, and many of the forms of the Gesamt Kunstwerk, or total artwork, which Kelly found so compelling, share a commitment to a projected future, whether a better and more total aesthetic experience, as with Wagner seen here, or a better place to live and means of living, as with the Bauhaus, or an aesthetically ameliorated urban environment with its accoutrements, as in Mondrian. This is Mike's sex to sexty uh, put inside there in the top middle register. But Kelly's proposals are quite differently predicated. There's no final destination, and he doesn't imagine that we go anywhere, or even in many cases that we transform in any way. Utopianism is effectively remaindered and then trapped in the discourses mobilized by the artist. Witness the failed utopianism of religion. Witness the pathetic liberation offered by an office party or dressing up, even the mythology of the carnivalesque is exposed. But Kelly deployed a whole arsenal of comedic effects to outflank the pressures of the future. He took up with comedy in a rainbow coalition of joke telling, remorseless irony, vaudeville, back alley diatribe, a nimble literary wit. His comedy was mostly blue and often black. But in particular, I think, Mike updated the terms and in recent work, um, particularly the hermaphrodite drawings seen um, in London in 2010 and a series of portraits of teachers, mentors, and friends from his CalArts days left in his studio, ran riot with the genre of caricature. These are transvestite Henry Moore from 2006 on the left and one of the late caricatural drawings on the right. This is caricature from the Morgue series, 1999, with the enlarged head of caricature is like the enlarged head of a fetus. So much in the lives he lived, witnessed, and represented was beset by the structures of distortion and exaggeration that organize this way of seeing the world. 
But for Mike, caricature was not just a set of formal deviations directed at the traits and foibles of various individuals, but rather an operating system that seemed already to have organized many of the social relations that he encountered. It was his way of dealing with the way of the past and the way the past and the present collided while deferring the arbitrations of the future. These are number one and eight from the Roth, Mouse, Wolverton drawing exercises from 93. Mike's caricature thus absorbed and recycled the already distorted orders of class formation, sexuality, religious belief, art world elitism, American identity, and so on, and then distorted them again with his unstintingly focused combinations of satire and parody. The shifting conditions between caricature and these other effects offer one measure of the layeredness of Mike's work and a leading reason why it was sometimes seen only from one or another point of view within the several that it collided and was in thus set this sense occasionally misunderstood or undervalued. The face of man on the left from 99 from the Morgue series again and hidden profile F from 94. Final section, religion. Much of what Mike made and wrote refers to the erosion, falling off, an unanchored rehabilitation of belief in contemporary life as its religious and ethical tread has been utterly worn away. A set of questions we explored in a recent conversation with our friend Jim Shaw, you see it here. Now one set of relations between belief and religion and their social effects directed them through the conditions and experiences of art itself, viewed as an irresistible token of the fallen nature of humankind. As we've seen today already, Mike's association of art with guilt criminality and behavioral extremism courses through the 43 quotations selected from a constellation of poets, artists, novelists, popes, and philosophers from Plato and Michael Bakunin to Edgar Degas and Oscar Wilde, painted onto monochrome portraits of their authors in red, green, purple, orange in Pay for Your Pleasure from 1988. This figurative mosaic of dark aphoristic opinion correlated art with savagery, extremism, lawlessness, outrage, cunning, destruction, murder, madness, and acts of random violence. The cumulative effect of these analogi analogies underlines the immoral and ungodly impulses of art and in effect generates a demonized aesthetic. So that by virtue, perhaps, of its explicit predication on sin, malice, and monstrosity, art production becomes something like the opposite of atonement. Rather than bringing humankind into sustained apposition with God, the securitization of a transcendent future, art is a solution in which the future can be dissolved. Now, Mike was unflinching about the associations he made and somewhat fearless about their implications. He looked at things and people so fully in the face that what he saw often passed right through them. I think he saw right through himself, too, even into the place where he is now. So the final frontier of death was inevitably one of the things at which he stared, as ever, unremittingly. Perhaps his most profound investigation of spirituality, especially as vested in the banner form, arose from an installation relating to Plato's cave, the trajectory of light in Plato's cave, put on by Creative Time as part of Art in the Anchorage in 1995, which used banners explicitly to create what Kelly termed, quote, a more overt reference to the religiosity of the space. 
Kelly explains the complex overlay of Christian aesthetic and self-reflexive references brought together here as follows. I did a banner that was a self-portrait after the Shroud of Turin, which is a kind of banner, and also a banner that was an artist's conception of Mark Rothko's bloodstain. I was also interested in the fact that Rothko's color system was the same as the Christian color iconographies for Lent. Now this alignment of the artist's self-portrait with the much revered and disputed vera icon, or the holy face of the um, Shroud of Turin, looks back to the work of Albrecht Dura, especially, of course, his self-portrait from, 19, uh, from uh, 1500, often referred to as the Christ, and others who explicitly coordinated their own visages with the icon-like appearance and posture of Christ. As Joseph Kerner suggests, the omnivoyant, en face pose of Dura's self-portrait was fashioned as an emblem of the power of the individual, producing a mythic illusion between image and maker, producer and product, art and artist, announcing that it is in art that human labor achieves its ideal. That's Kerner. While this humanist idealization was new and somewhat daring in 1500, it was already accompanied by something like its antithesis, which Kerner points to in the disfiguring counter vision of Hans Boldung Grien, in which the artist, enslaved by base desires, is present in his image only as a fallen voyeur. This is Grien on the left, Kelly on the right. Now, if Kerner explicates the intricately formatted co-emergence of selfhood, divine creativity, and the spectatorial grotesque in the tension between the Renaissance and the Lutheran Reformation, Kelly, if you like, works in the end game of a Catholic and postmodern reaction. In his latter-day counter-reformation, he incarnates the place of the low in the representation of the ultra high by haunting the holy image with symbolic displacement. At the same time, Kelly's religious vision elides not art per se with holy artist, as in the Dura, but art in the form of a potent modernist belief system coded by color with that most literally mortal of sins, the death of the artist by suicide. The first banner I did in this series was called Lent Felt, which was an Easter banner in Rothko colors. The Easter festival of death and resurrection is tied by color and concurrence to the demise of a modern artist who search for sublimity and transcendence was perhaps the most intense and tragic of any such quest in the 20th century. We witness here one of the most consequential of Kelly's unravelings of religious symbology and a clear reminder of her precept, his precept, that trying to make modernism spiritual is very sad. Hodelin's lines about the tragic serenity of Sophocles come to mind. Many attempted in vain with joy to express the most joyful. Here at last it is said, here in sadness to me. For instead of working with mere illusion, cross-reference or allegory, Kelly implodes the rote dependence of religious ritual, released from an infinite location that is also somehow outside of time, on denotative recurrence. By launching waves of interference between the historical events of Christianity and their theological codification, and episodes and symbolizations from modern art, Kelly bears witness to his own sardonic proposition that, quote, the history of Western art is also the history of Christian thought. 
At the same time, he genetically re-engineers the structural codependency of these terms, exposing their false purity and submitting them to another tautological dissolve. Rothko's Bloodstain, Artist's Conception, 1985, and Lent Felt. But Mike took it further. He doggedly diverted the bloody wound of Christ through the self-mortification of Rothko, an association triggered for him by an emblematic black and white photograph of the artist slumped in a pool of blood. In Plato's cave, he, in, he indulged in an even bolder reverie on the palette of corporeal distress inspired by the torment of the crucifixion. Quote, the shade of Christ's bruises are constant no matter what skin tone acts as their background. Black Jesus, red Jesus, yellow Jesus, white Jesus, all lie together in the same melting pot where fatty purple cooks to the top. This plum field painting of vital fluid darkens in hue as it flutters down into the depths, down, down, down. This tint is the initiator of my mind's fall into the shaft of memory. Mike mixes, as only Mike could, devotional ecstasy, pseudo-documentary description, and tropic virtuosity. He refers to the formal language of art, the question of a foreground and background embodied by the skin and wounds of Christ. He refers to an idiosyncratic color theory, the black, red, yellow, and white Jesuses, which draw on the Christ en couleur of Gauguin and the Nabi. He refers to food and cooking, the melting pot and the plum, and by implication to racial types denominated by color. This heretical recipe culminates in the shaft-like declension of memory and its precipitous downward fall, which operates as both a spatial simile and an explanation of the point of origin of the reverie itself, set off as it was by synaptic flashpoints triggered during the artist's descent into memorial association. What he saw through to here was only the way down. Down, down, down you go into a secret buried chamber. And once you've gotten past your trauma, your conditioning, once you've gotten past thinking that your life is surrounded by dirt, then things start to open up. In this blackness, can you tell the difference between the stifling claustrophobia of the living grave and the limitless expanses of outer space? I think not, so just relax. This would seem to be the end of it, the launch of a precipitation so far down that memory and darkness have become one and all is lost and buried. But of course, this very descent, even into a hellish void or the nothinglessness of dirt, is just a place of commencement where things, quote, start to open up and a ghoulish continuity is sparked between living death and cosmic speculation. We might glimpse here a negative cast of Walter Benjamin's invocation of messianic history, something that answers from the bottom up to the top-down transfigurations of divine or metaphysical ordination. This is Kelly's hope, born from hopelessness, his way through to a future that he knew or found or feared was always policed by the demons of the conditional. Thank you.
I guess we have uh, some time for comments or questions if, uh, if you have the patience after a long half day. Hi, this is, this is Stacy Wolf standing in the back. Hi, Stacey. Um, so I'm, I am challenged um, by what you said about taking uh, Kelly's writings as their own performances. And so I'm curious if you think we are to believe any of the things that he says about Day is Done in the catalog, either the notes on the music, the essay that he writes that's before your essay, or any of the writing in that particular text. Thanks. Well, I, I think I was at, at some pains to, to show that for Kelly, the possibility of these three modes of writing, the one that actually was fairly go ahead, straightforward, expository, telling us how things happened and the text in the catalog for Day is Done are very much of that order because they, they collect uh, the literal uh, uh, scripts and exchanges in the, uh, um, in the uh, individual performances. Um, they have like liner notes, uh, you know, expanded from what you might find on a CD about the music. And, and there is, frankly, when you read those closely, there's quite a lot of irony and, you know, double entendre in them. But, you know, at some level, they're talking about church music and gospel and techno and all the different, you know, the 30 different kinds of uh, musical genre uh, that Mike invested in to do this, uh, to do this production. So, yes, I mean, at, at, at that level, those texts and... I would also say some of the texts in Foul Perfection, the volume of his writings, which, uh, which collects essays that he wrote mostly on other, other people's work, um, they're in that category of exposition, and he was cool, he was fine with that. He was writing, you know, he said it quite explicitly, he was taking on the rhetoric and manner of a, a critic or an art historian, um, and this is where the, the, the sort of uh, the needle would come in because he said because no one else was was doing this no one was writing on these people no one was writing at that point on on John Miller no one was writing you know what was really interesting about Jim Shaw no one was doing the kind of work on the people whose whose work he he was really really close to and and, and, and people he was close to. So he did it. He just took it upon himself to do it, and he did it, you know, sort of like he would do if you were writing in those days for Art Forum. And one of the essays, The Foul Perfection, that titles the book, was indeed published in, in Art Forum, I think, in um, 1990 or 89. Uh, so, so, yeah, that strand exists. And then there's this sort of middle ground strand where he's being self consciously projective and performative but in a way you can really sort of identify with, like the writer of a script, you know, that's not based on truth. It's not a documentary, it's a script, and it's a product of fantasy and fiction and projection, and there is dialogue, and people say things, and what they say shouldn't be identified with the author that wrote it any more with Kelly than with anyone else. Of course, they become a little deformed and strange as, as time goes on. They're not quite so straight ahead. Um, and then finally, there's this sort of wild manifesto strand of writing uh, that is really hard. I mean, it's, it's very groundless, it's very fantastical, it's extremely projected, it's very perverse, it mixes, you know, uh, the most intense form of, of abuse narratives from an imagined past of Kelly's own, but it's not necessarily the true past, and it mixes those with uh, quotations, appropriations, all sorts of things. It's, it's properly speaking, you know, postmodernist experimental prose, I suppose you would have said several years ago. Um, but the thing is, the categories are not watertight. So in every category, something of almost the other two categories almost always bleeds into it in some way. Um, and that's, I think, what makes the whole vortex of Keller's writing so challenging and exciting. I don't know if anyone wants to wrap up. Jenny, do you want well, to? Well, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, everyone who talked and participated. Um, if you haven't had enough, there's more My Kelly live programming, so please come back, and thank you very much, everyone.